Section 15 of Thrilling Adventures by Land and Sea by James O. Brayman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 15. A Battle with Snakes. Since the exhibitions in London of the two Hindu snake charmers, the first, we believe, who ever visited Europe, everything relating to serpents seems to have acquired additional interest many facts regarding the nature and habits of the various species have been published according much information and still greater astonishment waterton in his wanderings in south america and the antilles in eighteen twelve to twenty four relates some stories of so marvellous a character that coming from a less authentic source their truth might be reasonably doubted while in the region of Mibri Hill, Mr. Waterton long sought in vain for a serpent of large size, and finally offered a reward to the negroes if they would find him one. A few days afterward, one of the natives, followed by his little dog, came to him with the information that a snake of respectable dimensions had been discovered a short distance up the hill, and armed with an eight-feet lance and accompanied by two negroes with cutlasses and the dog he at once departed to take a look at it mr waterton states that he was barefoot with an old hat check shirt and trousers on and a pair of braces to keep them up his snake ship was pointed out as lying at the roots of a large tree which had been torn up by a whirlwind but the remainder of the story shall be given in the traveller's own words i advanced up to the place slow and cautious the snake was well concealed but at last i made him out it was a culacanara not poisonous but large enough to have crushed any of us to death on measuring him afterward he was something more than fourteen feet long this species of snake is very rare and much thicker in proportion to its length than any other snake in the forest a culacanara of fourteen feet in length is as thick as a common boa of twenty-four feet after skinning this snake i could easily get my head into his mouth as the singular formation of the jaws admits of wonderful extension on ascertaining the size of the serpent i retired slowly the way i came and promised four dollars to the negro who had shown it to me and one dollar to the other who had joined us aware that the day was on the decline and that the approach of night would be detrimental to the dissection a thought struck me that i could take him alive i imagined that if i could strike him with the lance behind the head and pin him to the ground i might succeed in capturing him when i told this to the negroes they begged and entreated me to let them go for a gun and bring more force as they were sure the snake would kill some of us taking however a cutlass from one of the negroes and then ranging both the sable slaves behind me i told them to follow me and that i would cut them down if they offered to fly when we got up to the place the serpent had not stirred but i could see nothing of his head and judged by the folds of his body that it must be at the farthest side of the den a species of woodbine formed a complete mantle over the branches of the fallen tree almost impervious to the rain or the rays of the sun probably he had resorted to this sequestered place for a length of time as it bore marks of an ancient settlement I now took my knife, determined to cut away the woodbine and break the twigs in the gentlest manner possible, till I could get a view of his head. One negro stood guard close behind me with a cutlass. The cutlass, which I had taken from the first negro, was on the ground close beside me, in case of need. After working in dead silence for a quarter of an hour, with one knee all the time on the ground, I had cleared away enough to see his head it appeared coming out between the first and second coils of his body and was flat on the ground this was the very position i wished it to be in i rose in silence and retreated very slowly making a sign to the negroes to do the same the dog was sitting at a distance in mute observance i could now read in the faces of the negroes that they considered this a very unpleasant affair and they made another vain attempt to persuade me to let them go for a gun i smiled in a good-natured manner and made a feint to cut them down with the weapon i had in my hand 
this was all the answer i made to their request and they looked very uneasy it must be observed that we were about twenty yards from the snake's den i now ranged the negroes behind me and told him who stood next to me to lay hold of the lance the moment i struck the snake and that the other must attend my movements it now only remained to take their cutlasses from them for i was sure that if i did not disarm them they would be tempted to strike the snake in time of danger and thus forever spoil his skin on taking their cutlasses from them if i might judge from their physiognomy they seemed to consider it as a most intolerable act of tyranny probably nothing kept them from bolting but the consolation that i was betwixt them and the snake indeed my own heart in spite of all i could do beat quicker than usual we went slowly on in silence without moving our arms or heads in order to prevent all alarm as much as possible lest the snake should glide off or attack us in self-defence i carried the lance perpendicularly before me with the point about a foot from the ground the snake had not moved and on getting up to him i struck him with the lance on the near side just behind the neck and pinned him to the ground that moment the negro next to me seized the lance and held it firm in its place while i dashed head foremost into the den to grapple with the snake and to get hold of his tail before he could do any mischief on pinning him to the ground with the lance he gave a tremendous loud hiss and the little dog ran away howling as he went we had a sharp fray in the den the rotten sticks flying on all sides and each party struggling for superiority i called out to the second negro to throw himself upon me as i found i was not heavy enough he did so and the additional weight was of great service i had now got a firm hold of his tail and after a violent struggle or two he gave in finding himself overpowered this was the moment to secure him so while the first negro continued to hold the lance firmly to the ground and the other was helping me i contrived to unloosen my braces and with them tied the snake's mouth the snake now finding himself in an unpleasant predicament tried to better himself and set resolutely to work but we overpowered him we contrived to make him twist himself round the shaft of the lance and then prepared to convey him out of the forest i stood at his head and held it firm under my arm one negro supporting the belly and the other the tail in this order we began to move slowly toward home and reached it after resting ten times for the snake was too heavy for us to support without stopping to recruit our strength as we proceeded onward with him he fought hard for freedom but it was all in vain we untied the mouth of the bag kept him down by main force and then cut his throat the week following a curious conflict took place near the spot where i had captured the large snake in the morning i had been following a species of paroquet and the day being rainy i had taken an umbrella to keep the gun dry and had left it under a tree in the afternoon i took daddy quashi the negro with me to look for it while he was searching about curiosity led me toward the place of the late scene of action there was a path where timber had formerly been dragged along here i observed a young kulakanara ten feet long slowly moving onward and i saw he was thick enough to break my arm in case he got twisted around it there was not a moment to be lost i laid hold of his tail with the left hand one knee being on the ground and with the right hand i took off my hat and held it as i would hold a shield for defence the snake instantly turned and came on at me with his head about a yard from the ground as if to ask me what business i had to take such liberties with his tail i let him come hissing and open-mouthed within two feet of my face and then with all the force that i was master of drove my fist shielded by my hat full in his jaws he was stunned and confounded by the blow and ere he could recover himself i had seized his throat with both hands in such a position that he could not bite me i then allowed him to coil himself around my body and marched off with him as my lawful prize he pressed me hard but not alarmingly so estille's defeat 
in the spring of seventeen eighty two a party of twenty five wyandots secretly approached estille station and committed shocking outrages entering a cabin they tomahawked and scalped a woman and her two daughters the neighborhood was instantly alarmed captain estille speedily collected a body of twenty-five men and pursued the hostile trail with great rapidity he came up with the savages on hinkston fork of licking immediately after they had crossed it and a most severe and desperate conflict ensued estille unfortunately sent six of his men under lieutenant miller to attack the enemy's rear the indian leader immediately availed himself of this diminution of force rushed upon the weakened line of his adversaries and compelled him to give way a total rout ensued captain estille was killed together with his gallant lieutenant south four men were wounded and fortunately escaped nine fell under the tomahawk and were scalped the indians also suffered severely and are believed to have lost half of their warriors incident at niagara falls on saturday the thirteenth of july eighteen fifty as a boy ten years old was rowing his father over to their home on grand island the father being so much intoxicated as not to be able to assist any more than to steer the canoe the wind which was very strong off shore so frustrated the efforts of his tiny arm that the canoe in spite of him got into the current and finally into the rapids within a very few rods of the falls on went the frail shell careering and plunging as the mad waters chose still the gallant little oarsman maintained his struggle with the raging billows and actually got the canoe by his persevering manoeuvring so close to iris island as to have her driven by a providential wave in between the little islands called the sisters here the father and his dauntless boy were in still greater danger for an instant for there is a fall between the two islands over which had they gone no earthly power could have withheld their final passage to the terrific precipice which forms the horseshoe fall but the sudden dash of a wave capsized the canoe and left the two struggling in the water being near a rock and shallow the boy lost no time but seizing his father by the coat collar dragged him up to a place of safety where the crowd of anxious citizens awaited to lend assistance the poor boy on reaching the shore in safety instantly fainted while his miserable father was sufficiently sobered by the perils he had passed through the canoe was dashed to pieces on the rocks ere it reached its final leap a skater chased by a wolf a thrilling incident in american country life is vividly sketched in evenings at donelson manor in the winter of eighteen forty four the relator went out one evening to skate on the kennebec in maine by moonlight and having ascended that river nearly two miles turned into a little stream to explore its course fir and hemlock of a century's growth he says met overhead and formed an archway radiant with frostwork all was dark within but i was young and fearless and as i peered into an unbroken forest that reared itself on the borders of the stream i laughed with very joyousness my wild hurrah rang through the silent woods and i stood listening to the echo that reverberated again and again until all was hushed suddenly a sound arose it seemed to me to come from beneath the ice it sounded low and tremulous at first until it ended in a low wild yell i was appalled never before had such a noise met my ears i thought it more than mortal so fierce and amid such an unbroken solitude it seemed as though from the tread of some brute animal and the blood rushed back to my forehead with a bound that made my skin burn and i felt relieved that i had to contend with things earthly and not spiritual my energies returned and i turned around me for some means of escape as i turned my head to the shore i could see two dark objects dashing through the underbrush at a pace nearly double in speed to my own by this rapidity and the short yells they occasionally gave i knew at once that these were the much dreaded gray wolf 
i had never met with these animals but from the description given of them i had very little pleasure in making their acquaintance their untamable fierceness and the enduring strength which seems part of their nature render them objects of dread to every benighted traveller there was no time for thought so i bent my head and dashed madly forward nature turned me toward home the light flakes of snow spun from the iron skates and i was some distance from my pursuers when their fierce howl told me i was their fugitive i did not look back i did not feel afraid or sorry or even glad one thought of home the bright faces waiting my return of their tears if they should never see me again and then every energy of body and mind was exerted for escape i was perfectly at home on the ice many were the days i had spent on my good skates never thinking that at one time they would be my only means of safety every half minute an alternate yelp from my ferocious followers told me too certain that they were in close pursuit nearer and nearer they came i heard their feet pattering on the ice nearer still until i could feel their breath and hear their sniffling scent every nerve and muscle in my frame was stretched to the utmost tension the trees along the shore seemed to dance in the uncertain light and my brain turned with my own breathless speed yet still they seemed to hiss forth their breath with a sound truly horrible when an involuntary motion on my part turned me out of my course the wolves close behind unable to stop and as unable to turn on the smooth ice slipped and fell still going on far ahead their tongues were lolling out their white tusks glaring from their bloody mouths their dark shaggy breasts were fleeced with foam and as they passed me their eyes glared and they howled with fury the thought flashed on my mind that by these means i could avoid them viz by turning aside whenever they came too near for they by the formation of their feet were unable to run on the ice except in a straight line at one time by delaying my turning too long my sanguinary antagonists came so near that they threw the white foam over my dress as they sprang to seize me and their teeth clashed together like the spring of a fox trap had my skates failed for an instant had i tripped on a stick or caught my foot in a fissure in the ice the story i am now telling would never have been told i thought over all the chances i knew where they would take hold of me if i fell i thought how long it would be before i died and then there would be a search for the body that would already have its tomb for oh how fast man's mind traces out all the dread colours of death's picture only those who have been so near the grim original can tell but i soon came opposite the house and my hounds i knew their deep voices roused by the noise bayed furiously from the kennels i heard their chains rattle how i wished they would break them and then i would have protectors that would be peer to the fiercest denizens of the forest the wolves taking the hint conveyed by the dogs stopped in their mad career and after a moment's consideration turned and fled i watched them until their dusky forms disappeared over a neighbouring hill then taking off my skates i wended my way to the house with feelings which may be better imagined than described but even yet i never see a broad sheet of ice in the moonshine without thinking of the sniffling breath and those fearful things that followed me closely down the frozen kennebec our flag on the rocky mountains we find the following incident of placing the american flag on the highest point of the rocky mountains in colonel fremont's narrative we managed to get our mules up to a little bench about a hundred feet above the lakes where there was a patch of good grass and turned them loose to graze during our rough ride to this place they had exhibited a wonderful sure-footedness parts of the defile were filled with angular sharp fragments of rock three or four and eight or ten feet cube and among these they had worked their way leaping from one narrow point to another rarely making a false step and giving us no occasion to dismount having divested ourselves of every unnecessary encumbrance we commenced the ascent 
this time like experienced travellers we did not press ourselves but climbed leisurely sitting down so soon as we found breath beginning to fail at intervals we readied places where a number of springs gushed from the rocks and about eighteen hundred feet above the lakes came to the snow line from this point our progress was uninterrupted climbing hitherto i had worn a pair of thick moccasins with soles of parfleche but here i put on a light thin pair which i had brought for the purpose as now the use of our toes became necessary to a further advance i availed myself of a sort of comb of the mountain which stood against the wall like a buttress and which the wind and the solar radiation joined to the steepness of the smooth rock had kept almost entirely free from snow up this i made my way rapidly our cautious method of advancing at the outset had spared my strength and with the exception of a slight disposition to headache i felt no remains of yesterday's illness in a few minutes we reached a point where the buttress was overhanging and there was no other way of surmounting the difficulty than by passing around one side of it which was the face of a vertical precipice of several hundred feet putting hands and feet in the crevices between the blocks i succeeded in getting over it and when i reached the top found my companions in a small valley below descending to them we continued climbing and in a short time reached the crest i sprang upon the summit and another step would have precipitated me into an immense snow-field five hundred feet below to the edge of this field was a sheer icy precipice and then with a gradual fall the field sloped off for about a mile until it struck the foot of another lower ridge i stood on a narrow crest about three feet in width with an inclination of about twenty degrees north fifty one degrees east as soon as i had gratified the first feelings of curiosity i descended and each man ascended in his turn for i would only allow one at a time to mount the unstable and precarious slab which it seemed a breath would hurl into the abyss below we mounted the barometer in the snow of the summit and fixing a ramrod in a crevice unfurled the national flag to wave in the breeze where flag never waved before during our morning's ascent we had met no signs of animal life except a small sparrow-like bird a stillness the most profound and a terrible solitude forced themselves constantly on the mind as the great features of the place here on the summit where the stillness was absolute unbroken by any sound and solitude complete we thought ourselves beyond the region of animated life but while we were sitting on the rock a solitary bee bromus the humble bee came winging his flight from the eastern valley and lit on the knee of one of the men it was a strange place the icy rock and the highest peak of the rocky mountains for a lover of warm sunshine and flowers and we pleased ourselves with the idea that he was the first of his species to cross the mountain barrier a solitary pioneer to foretell the advance of civilization i believe that a moment's thought would have made us let him continue his way unharmed but we carried out the law of this country where all animated nature seems at war and seizing him immediately put him in at least a fit place in the leaves of a large book among the flowers we had collected on our way running the canyon colonel fremont in his narrative gives the following account of a perilous adventure of himself and party in attempting to run a canyon on the river platte they had previously passed three cataracts we re-embarked at nine o'clock and in about twenty minutes reached the next canyon landing on a rocky shore at its commencement we ascended the ridge to reconnoitre portage was out of the question so far as we could see the jagged rocks pointed out the course of the canyon in a winding line of seven or eight miles it was simply a narrow dark chasm in the rock and here the perpendicular faces were much higher than in the previous pass being at this end two to three hundred and further down as we afterward ascertained five hundred feet in vertical height 
our previous success had made us bold and we determined again to run the canyon everything was secured as firmly as possible and having divested ourselves of the greater part of our clothing we pushed into the stream to save our chronometer from accident mr preuss took it and attempted to proceed along the shore on the masses of rock which in places were piled up on either side but after he had walked about five minutes everything like shore disappeared and the vertical wall came squarely down into the water he therefore waited until we came up an ugly pass lay before us we had made fast to the stern of the boat a strong rope about fifty feet long and three of the men clambered along among the rocks and with this rope let her slowly through the pass in several places high rocks lay scattered about in the channel and in the narrows it required all our strength and skill to avoid staving the boat on the sharp points in one of these the boat proved a little too broad and stuck fast for an instant while the water flew over us fortunately it was but for an instant as our united strength forced her immediately through the water swept overboard only a sextant and a pair of saddlebags i caught the sextant as it passed by me but the saddlebags became the prey of the whirlpools we reached the place where mr preuss was standing took him on board and with the aid of the boat put the men with the rope on the succeeding pile of rocks we found this passage much worse than the previous one and our position was rather a bad one to go back was impossible before us the cataract was a sheet of foam and shut up in the chasm by the rocks which in some places seemed almost to meet overhead the roar of the water was deafening we pushed off again but after making a little distance the force of the current became too great for the men on shore and two of them let go the rope la jeunesse the third man hung on and was jerked head foremost into the river from a rock about twelve feet high and down the boat shot like an arrow basile following us in the rapid current and exerting all his strength to keep in mid-channel his head only seen occasionally like a black spot in the white foam how far we went i do not exactly know but we succeeded in turning the boat into an eddy below Dieu, said basile la jeunesse as he arrived immediately after us je crois bien que je nage un demi mile he had owed his life to his skill as a swimmer and i determined to take him and two others on board and trust to skill and fortune to reach the other end in safety we placed ourselves on our knees with the short paddles in our hands the most skilful boatman being at the bow and again we commenced our rapid descent we cleared rock after rock and shot past fall after fall our little boat seeming to play with a cataract we became flushed with success and familiar with danger and yielding to the excitement of the occasion broke forth into a canadian boat song singing or rather shouting we dashed along and were i believe in the midst of the chorus when the boat struck a concealed rock immediately at the foot of a fall which whirled her over in an instant three of my men could not swim and my first feeling was to assist them and save some of our effects but a sharp concussion or two convinced me that i had not yet saved myself a few strokes brought me into an eddy and i landed on a pile of rocks at the left side looking round i saw that mr preuss had gained the shore on the same side about twenty yards below and a little climbing and swimming soon brought him to my side on the opposite side against the wall lay the boat bottom up and lambert was in the act of saving Descoteau, whom he had grasped by the hair and who could not swim for a hundred yards below the current was covered with floating books and boxes bales and blankets and scattered articles of clothing and so strong and boiling was the stream that even our heavy instruments which were all in cases kept on the surface and the sextant circle and the long black box of the telescope were in view at once for a moment i felt somewhat disheartened all our books almost every record of the journey our journals and registers of astronomical and barometrical observations had been lost in a moment 
but it was no time to indulge in regrets and i immediately set about endeavouring to save something from the wreck making ourselves understood as well as possible by signs for nothing could be heard in the roar of the waters we commenced our operations of everything on board the only article that had been saved was my double-barrelled gun which Descoteau had caught and clung to with drowning tenacity the men continued down the river on the left bank mr preuss and myself descended on the side we were on and la jeunesse with a paddle in his hand jumped on the boat alone and continued down the canyon she was now light and cleared every bad place with much less difficulty in a short time he was joined by lambert and the search was continued for about a mile and a half which was as far as the boat could proceed in the pass here the walls were about five hundred feet high and the fragments of rocks from above had choked the river into a hollow pass but one or two feet above the surface through this and the interstices of the rock the water found its way favored beyond our expectations all our registers had been recovered with the exception of one of my journals which contained the notes and incidents of travel and topographical descriptions a number of scattered astronomical observations principally meridian altitudes of the sun and our barometrical register west of laramie fortunately our other journals contained duplicates of the most important barometrical observations in addition to these we saved the circle and these with a few blankets constituted everything that had been rescued from the waters End of section fifteen Section 16 of Thrilling Adventures by Land and Sea by James O. Brayman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 16. The Rescue. A young girl had been captured at her father's hut when all the males of the household were absent hunting wolves. She is seized by the Indians and borne swiftly away to the encampment of a war party of the Osages. She is then placed in a land canoe and hurried rapidly forward toward their villages. Among the party she recognizes one whose life she had been instrumental in saving when a prisoner. He recognizes her and promises to assist her escape. At this point the following narrative commences. At a late and solemn hour the Indian, who had been the captive the night before, suddenly ceased his snoring, which had been heard without intermission for a great length of time, and when Mary instinctively cast her eyes toward him, she was surprised to see him gently and slowly raise his head. He enjoined silence by placing his hand upon his mouth. After carefully disengaging himself from his comrades, he crept quietly away and soon vanished entirely from sight on the northern side of the spreading beach. Mary expected he would soon return and assist her to escape. Although she was aware of the hardships and perils that would attend her flight, yet the thought of again meeting her friends was enough to nerve her for the undertaking, and she awaited with anxious impatience the coming of her rescuer but he came not she could attribute no other design in his conduct but that of effecting her escape and yet he neither came for her nor beckoned her away she had reposed confidence in his promise for she knew that the indian savage as he was rarely forfeited his word but when gratitude inspired a pledge she could not believe that he would use deceit the fire was now burning quite low and its waning light scarce cast a beam upon the branches overhead it was evidently not far from morning and every hope of present escape entirely fled from her bosom but just as she was yielding to despair she saw the indian returning in a stealthy pace bearing some dark object in his arms he glided to her side and motioned her to leave the snow canoe and also to take with her all her robes with which she had been enveloped she did his bidding and then he carefully deposited the burden he bore in the place she had just occupied a portion of the object becoming unwrapped mary discovered it to be a huge mass of snow resembling in some respects a human form and the indian stratagem was at once apparent to her 
relinquishing herself to his guidance she was led noiselessly through the bushes about a hundred paces distant from the fire to a large fallen tree that had yielded to some furious storm when her conductor paused he pointed to a spot where a curve caused the tree trunk to rise about a foot from the surface of the snow under which was a round hole cut through the drifted snow down to the earth and in which were deposited several buffalo robes and so arranged that a person could repose within without coming in contact with the frozen element around mary looked down and then at her companion to ascertain his intentions he spoke to her in a low tone enough of which she comprehended to understand that he desired her to descend into the pit without delay she obeyed and when he had carefully folded the robes and diverse furs about her body he stepped a few paces to one side and gently lifting up a round lid of snow crust placed it over the aperture it had been so smoothly cut and fitted with such precision when replaced that no one would have been able to discover that an incision had been made he then bid mary a good-bye in bad english and set off on a run in a northern direction for the purpose of joining the whites with the first light of morning the war party sprang to their feet and hastily dispatching a slight repast they set out on their journey with renewed animation and increased rapidity before starting the chief called to mary and again offered some food but no reply being returned or motion discovered under the robe which he imagined enveloped her he supposed she was sleeping and directed the party to select the most even route when they emerged in the prairie that she might as much as possible enjoy her repose the indian who had planned and executed the escape of mary with the well-devised cunning for which the race is proverbial had told his companions that he would rise before day and pursue the same direction in advance of them and endeavour to kill a deer for their next night's meal thus his absence created no suspicion and the party continued their precipitate retreat but about noon after casting many glances back at the supposed form of the captive reclining peacefully in the snow canoe the chief with much excitement betrayed by his looks which seemed to be mingled with an apprehension that she was dead abruptly ordered the party to halt he sprang to the canoe and convulsively tearing away the skins discovered only the roll of snow he at first compressed his lips in momentary rage and then burst into a fit of irrepressible laughter but the rest raved and stamped and uttered direful imprecations and threats of vengeance immediately they were aware of the treachery of the absent indian and resolved with one voice that his blood should be an atonement for the act the snow was quickly thrown out and the war party adjusted their weapons with the expectation of encountering the whites and then whirling about they retraced their steps far more swiftly than they had been advancing just as the night was setting in they came in sight of the grove where they had encamped they slackened their pace and looking eagerly forward seemed to think it not improbable that the whites had arrived in the vicinity and might be lying in ambush awaiting their return in search of the maid they then abandoned the canoe after having concealed it under some low bushes and entered the grove in a stooping and watchful posture ere long the chief attained the immediate neighbor of the spreading tree and with an arrow drawn to its head crept within a few paces of the spot where he had lain the preceding night his party were mostly a few feet in the rear while a few were approaching in the same manner from the opposite direction hearing no sound whatever he rose up slowly and with an ugh of disappointment strode carelessly across the silent and untenanted place of encampment vexation and anger were expressed by the savages in being thus disappointed they hoped to wreak their vengeance on the whites and resolved to recapture the maiden where they expected to find them the scene was silent and desolate and they now sauntered about under the trees in the partial light of the moon that struggled through the matted branches threatening in the most horrid manner the one who had thus baffled them some struck their tomahawks into the trunks of trees while others brandished their knives and uttered direful threats the young chief stood in silence with his arms folded on his breast 
a small ray of light that fell upon his face exhibited a meditative brow and features expressing both firmness and determination he had said that the captive should be regained and his followers ever and anon regarded his thoughtful attitude with the confidence that his decision would hasten the accomplishment of their desires long he remained thus motionless and dignified and no one dared to address him the young chief called one of the oldest of the party who was standing a few paces distant absorbed in thought to his side and after a short conference the old savage prostrated himself on the snow and endeavoured like a hound to scent the tracks of his recreant brother at first he met with no success but when making a wide circuit round the premises, still applying his nose to the ground occasionally, and minutely examining the bushes, he paused abruptly and announced to the party that he had found the precise direction taken by the maid and her deliverer. Instantly they all clustered round him, evincing the most intense interest. Some smelt the surface of the snow, and others examined the bushes small twigs not larger than pins were picked up and closely scrutinized they well knew that any one passing through the frozen and clustered bushes must inevitably sever some of the twigs and buds their progress was slow but unerring the course they pursued was the direction taken by mary and her rescuer it was not long before they arrived within a few feet of the place of the maiden's concealment but now they were at fault there were no bushes immediately around the fallen tree they paused the chief in the van with their bows and arrows and tomahawks in readiness for instant use they knew that the maiden could not return to her friends on foot or the treacherous savage be able to bear her far on his shoulder they thought that one or both must be concealed somewhere in the neighbourhood and the fallen tree were it hollow was the place most likely to be selected for that purpose after scanning the fallen trunk a few minutes in silence and discovering nothing to realize their hopes they uttered a terrific yell and commenced striking their tomahawks in the wood and ripping up the bark in quest of some hiding place but their search was in vain the fallen trunk was sound and solid throughout and the young chief sat down on it within three paces of mary others in passing about frequently trod on the very verge of the concealed pit mary was awakened by the yell but knew not that the sound came from her enemies the indian had told her that he would soon return and her heart now fluttered with the hope that her father and her friends were at hand yet she prudently determined not to rush from her concealment until she was better assured of the fact she did not think that the savages would ever suspect that she was hid under the snow but yet she thought it very strange that her father did not come to her at once several minutes had elapsed since she had been startled by the sounds in the immediate vicinity she heard the tramp of men almost directly over her head and the strokes against the fallen trunk she was several times on the eve of rising up but was as often withheld by some mysterious impulse she endeavoured to reflect calmly but still she could not by any mode of conjecture realise the probability of her foes having returned and traced her thither yet an undefinable fear still possessed her and she endeavoured with patience to await the pleasure of her friends but when the chief seated himself in her vicinity and fell into one of his fits of abstraction and the whole party became comparatively still and hushed the poor girl's suspense was almost insufferable she knew that human beings were all around her and yet her situation was truly pitiable and lonely she felt assured that if the war party had returned in pursuit of her the means which enabled them to retrace their victim to the fallen trunk would likewise have sufficed to indicate her hiding-place then why should they hesitate the yells that awakened her were not heard distinctly and under the circumstances she could not believe that she was surrounded by savages on the other hand if they were her friends why did they not relieve her 
now a sudden but alas erroneous thought occurred to her she was persuaded that they were her friends but that the friendly indian was not with them he had perhaps directed them where she could be found and then returned to his home might not her friends at that moment be anxiously searching for her would not one word suffice to dispel their solicitude and restore the lost one to their arms she resolved to speak bowing down her head slightly so that her precise location might not instantly be ascertained she uttered in a soft voice the word father the chief sprang from his seat and the party was instantly in commotion some of the savages looked above among the twining branches and some shot their arrows in the snow but fortunately not in the direction of mary while others ran about in every direction examining all the large trees in the vicinity the chief was amazed and utterly confounded he drew not forth an arrow nor brandished a tomahawk while he thus stood and the rest of the party were moving hurriedly about a few paces distant mary again repeated the word father as suddenly as if by enchantment every savage was paralyzed each stood as devoid of animation as a statue for many moments an intense silence reigned as if naught existed there but the cheerless forest trees slowly at length the tomahawk was returned to the belt and the arrow to the quiver no longer was a desire to spill blood manifested the dusky children of the forest attributed to the mysterious sound a supernatural agency they believed it was a voice from the perennial hunting grounds humbly they bowed their heads and whispered devotions to the great spirit the young chief alone stood erect he gazed at the round moon above him and sighs burst from his breast and burning tears ran down his stained cheek impatiently by a motion of the hand he directed the savages to leave him and when they withdrew he resumed his seat on the fallen trunk and reclined his brow upon his hand one of the long feathers that decked his head waved forward after he had been seated thus a few minutes and when his eye rested upon it he started up wildly and tearing it away trampled it under his feet at that instant the same father was again heard the young chief fell upon his knees and while he panted convulsively said in english father mother i'm your poor william you loved me much where are you oh tell me i will come to you i want to see you he then fell prostrate and groaned piteously father oh where are you whose voice was that said mary breaking through the slight incrustation that obscured her and leaping from her covert the young chief sprang from the earth gazed a moment at the maid spoke rapidly and loudly in the language of his tribe to his party who were now at the place of encampment seated by the fire they had kindled and then seizing his tomahawk was in the act of hurling it at mary when the yells of the war party and the ringing discharges of firearms arrested his steel when brandished in the air the white men had arrived the young chief seized mary by her long flowing hair again prepared to strike the fatal blow when she turned her face upward and he again hesitated discharges in quick succession and nearer than before still rang in his ears mary strove not to escape nor did the indian strike the whites were heard rushing through the bushes the chief seized the trembling girl in his arms a bullet whizzed by his head but unmindful of danger he vanished among the dark bushes with his burden she's gone she's gone exclaimed roughgrove looking aghast at the vacated pit under the fallen trunk but we will have her yet said boone as he heard glenn discharge a pistol a few paces apart at the bushes the report was followed by a yell not from the chief but sneak and the next moment the rifle of the latter was likewise heard still the indian was not dispatched for the instant afterward his tomahawk which had been hurled without effect came sailing over the bushes and penetrated a tree hard by some fifteen or twenty feet above the earth where it entered the wood with such a force that it remained firmly fixed 
now succeeded a struggle a violent blow was heard the fall of the indian and all was still a minute afterward sneak emerged from the thicket bearing mary in his arms and followed by glenn is she dead oh she's dead cried roughgrove snatching her from the arms of sneak she has only fainted exclaimed glenn examining the body of the girl and finding no wounds she's recovering said boone feeling her pulse god be praised exclaimed roughgrove when returning animation was manifest oh i know you won't kill me for pity's sake spare me said mary it is your father my poor child said roughgrove pressing the girl to his heart it is it is cried the happy girl clinging rapturously to the old man's neck and then seizing the hands of the rest she seemed to be half wild with delight shipwreck of the medusa on the seventeenth of june eighteen sixteen the medusa french frigate commanded by captain chaumarez and accompanied by three smaller vessels sailed from the island of a for the coast of africa in order to take possession of some colonies on the first of july they entered the tropics and there with a childish disregard to danger and knowing that she was surrounded by all the unseen perils of the ocean her crew performed the ceremony usual to the occasion while the vessel was running headlong on destruction the captain presided over the disgraceful scene of merriment leaving the ship to the command of a monsieur rochefort who had passed the ten preceding years of his life in an english prison a few persons on board remonstrated in vain though it was ascertained that they were on the banks of arjuis she continued her course and heaved the lead without slackening the sail everything denoted shallow water but m rochefort persisted in saying that they were in one hundred fathoms at that very moment only six fathoms were found and the vessel struck three times being in about sixteen feet water and the tide full flood at ebb tide there remained but twelve feet water and after some bungling manoeuvres all hope of getting the ship off was abandoned when the frigate struck she had on board six boats of various capacities all of which could not contain the crew and passengers and a raft was constructed a dreadful scene ensued all scrambled out of the wreck without order or precaution the first who reached the boats refused to admit any of their fellow sufferers into them though there was ample room for more some apprehending that a plot had been formed to abandon them in the vessel flew to arms no one assisted his companions and captain chaumarez stole out of a porthole into his own boat leaving a great part of the crew to shift for themselves at length they put off to sea intending to steer for the sandy coast of the desert there to land and thence to proceed with a caravan to the island of st louis the raft had been constructed without foresight or intelligence it was about sixty-five feet long and twenty-five broad but the only part which could be depended upon was the middle and that was so small that fifteen persons could not lie down upon it those who stood on the floor were in constant danger of slipping through between the planks the sea flowed in on all its sides when one hundred and fifty passengers who were destined to be its burden were on board they stood like a solid parallelogram without a possibility of moving and they were up to their waists in water the desperate squadron had only proceeded three leagues when a faulty if not treacherous manoeuvre broke the tow-line which fastened the captain's boat to the raft and thus became the signal to all to let loose their cables the weather was calm the coast was known to be but twelve or fifteen leagues distant and the land was in fact discovered by the boats on the very same evening on which they abandoned the raft they were not therefore driven to this measure by any new perils and the cry of nous les abandonnons which resounded throughout the line was the yell of a spontaneous and instinctive impulse of cowardice perfidy and cruelty and the impulse was as unanimous as it was diabolical the raft was left to the mercy of the waves one after another the boats disappeared and despair became general 
not one of the promised articles no provisions except a very few casks of wine and some spoiled biscuit sufficient for one single meal was found a small pocket compass which chance had discovered their last guide in a trackless ocean fell between the beams into the sea as the crew had taken no nourishment since morning some wine and biscuit were distributed and this day the first of thirteen on the raft was the last on which they tasted any solid food except such as human nature shudders at the only thing which kept them alive was the hope of revenge on those who had treacherously betrayed them the first night was stormy and the waves which had free access committed dreadful ravages and threatened worse when day appeared twelve miserable wretches were found crushed to death between the openings of the raft and several more were missing but the number could not be ascertained as several soldiers had taken the billets of the dead in order to obtain two or even three rations the second night was still more dreadful and many were washed off although the crew had so crowded together that some were smothered by the mere pressure to soothe their last moments the soldiers drank immoderately and one who affected to rest himself upon the side but was treacherously cutting the ropes was thrown into the sea another whom m Corard had snatched from the waves turned traitor a second time as soon as he recovered his senses but he too was killed at length the revolted who were chiefly soldiers threw themselves upon their knees and abjectly implored mercy at midnight however they rebelled again those who had no arms fought with their teeth and thus many severe wounds were inflicted one was most wantonly and dreadfully bitten above the heel while his companions were beating him upon the head with their carbines before throwing him into the sea the raft was strewed with dead bodies after innumerable instances of treachery and cruelty and from sixty to sixty-five perished that night the force and courage of the strongest began to yield to their misfortunes and even the most resolute labored under mental derangement in the conflict the revolted had thrown two casks of wine and all the remaining water into the sea and it became necessary to diminish each man's share a day of comparative tranquillity succeeded the survivors erected their mast again which had been wantonly cut down in the battle of the night and endeavoured to catch some fish but in vain they were reduced to feed on the dead bodies of their companions a third night followed broken by the plaintive cries of wretches exposed to every kind of suffering ten or twelve of whom died of want and awfully foretold the fate of the remainder the following day was fine some flying fish were caught in the raft which mixed up with human flesh afforded one scanty meal a new insurrection to destroy the raft broke out on the fourth night this too was marked by perfidy and ended in blood most of the rebels were thrown into the sea the fifth morning mustered but thirty men alive and these sick and wounded with the skin of their lower extremities corroded by the salt water two soldiers were detected drinking the wine of the only remaining cask they were instantly thrown into the sea one boy died and there remained only twenty-seven of whom fifteen only seemed likely to live a council of war preceded by the most horrid despair was held as the weak consumed a part of the common store they determined to throw them into the sea this sentence was put into immediate execution and all the arms on board which now filled their minds with horror were with the exception of a single sabre committed to the deep distress and misery increased with an accelerated ratio and even after the desperate means of destroying their companions and eating the most nauseous aliments the surviving fifteen could not hope for more than a few days existence a butterfly lighted on their sail the ninth day and though it was held to be a messenger of good yet many a greedy eye was cast upon it three days more passed over in inexpressible anguish when they constructed a smaller and more manageable raft in the hope of directing it to the shore but on trial it was found insufficient 
on the seventeenth day a brig was seen which after exciting the vicissitude of hope and fear proved to be the argus sent out in quest of the medusa the inhabitants of the raft were all received on board and were again very nearly perishing by a fire which broke out in the night the six boats which had so cruelly cast them adrift reached the coast of africa in safety and after many dangers among the moors the survivors arrived at st louis after this a vessel was dispatched to the wreck of the medusa to carry away the money and provisions after beating about for eight days she was forced to return she again put to sea but after being away five days again came back ten days more were lost in repairing her and she did not reach the spot till fifty-two days after the vessel had been lost and dreadful to relate three miserable sufferers were found on board sixty men had been abandoned there by their magnanimous countrymen all these had been carried off except seventeen some of whom were drunk and others refused to leave the vessel they remained at peace as long as their provisions lasted twelve embarked on board a raft for sahara and were never more heard of another put to sea on a hen-coop and sunk immediately four remained behind one of whom exhausted with hunger and fatigue perished the other three lived in separate corners of the wreck and never met but to run at each other with drawn knives they were put on board the vessel with all that could be saved from the wreck of the medusa the vessel was no sooner seen returning to st louis than every heart beat high with joy in the hope of recovering some property the men and officers of the medusa jumped on board and asked if anything had been saved yes was the reply but it is all ours now and the naked frenchmen whose calamities had found pity from the moors of the desert were now deliberately plundered by their own countrymen a fair was held in the town which lasted eight days the clothes furniture and necessary articles of life belonging to the men and officers of the medusa were publicly sold before their faces such of the french as were able proceeded to the camp at decade and the sick remained at st louis the french governor had promised them clothes and provisions but sent none and during five months they owed their existence to strangers to the british end of section sixteen section seventeen of thrilling adventures by land and sea by james o'brayman this librivox recording is in the public domain section seventeen hunting the moose the habits of the moose in his manner of defence and attack are similar to those of the stag and may be illustrated by the following anecdote from the random sketches of a kentuckian whoever saw bravo without loving him his slow black eyes his glossy skin flecked here and there with blue his widespread thighs clean shoulders broad back and low drooping chest bespoke him the true staghound and none who ever saw his bounding form or heard his deep-toned bay as the swift-footed stag flew before him would dispute his title list gentle reader and i will tell you an adventure which will make you love him all the more a bright frosty morning in november eighteen thirty eight tempted me to visit the forest hunting grounds on this occasion i was followed by a fine-looking hound which had been presented to me a few days before by a fellow sportsman i was anxious to test his qualities and knowing that a mean dog will not often hunt well with a good one i had tied up the eager bravo and was attended by the strange dog alone a brisk canter of half an hour brought me to the wild forest hills slackening the rein i slowly wound my way up a bushy slope some three hundred yards in length i had ascended about half way when the hound began to exhibit signs of uneasiness and at the same instant a stag sprang out from some underbrush near by and rushed like a whirlwind up the slope a word and the hound was crouching at my feet and my trained cherokee with ear erect and flashing eye watched the course of the affrighted animal 
on the very summit of the ridge full one hundred and fifty yards every limb standing out in bold relief against the clear blue sky the stag paused and looked proudly down upon us after a moment of indecision i raised my rifle and sent the whizzing lead upon its errand a single bound and the antlered monarch was hidden from my view hastily running down a ball i ascended the slope my blood ran a little faster as i saw the gouts of blood which stained the withered leaves where he had stood one moment more and the excited hound was leaping breast high on his trail and the gallant cherokee bore his rider like lightning after them away away for hours we did thus hasten on without once being at fault or checking our headlong speed the chase had led us miles from the starting point and now appeared to be bearing up a creek on one side of which arose a precipitous hill some two miles in length which i knew the wounded animal would never ascend half a mile further on another hill reared its bleak and barren head on the opposite side of the rivulet once fairly in the gorge there was no exit save at the upper end of the ravine here then i must intercept my game which i was able to do by taking a nearer cut over the ridge that saved at least a mile giving one parting shout to cheer my dog cherokee bore me headlong to the pass i had scarcely arrived when black with sweat the stag came laboring up the gorge seemingly totally reckless of our presence again i poured forth the leaden messenger of death as meteor-like he flashed by us one bound and the noble animal lay prostrate within fifty feet of where i stood leaping from my horse and placing one knee upon his shoulder and a hand upon his antlers i drew my hunting knife but scarcely had its keen point touched his neck when with a sudden bound he threw me from his body and my knife was hurled from my hand in hunter's parlance i had only creased him i at once saw my danger but it was too late with one bound he was upon me wounding and almost disabling me with his sharp feet and horns i seized him by his widespread antlers and sought to regain possession of my knife but in vain each new struggle drew us further from it cherokee frightened at the unusual scene had madly fled to the top of the ridge where he stood looking down upon the combat trembling and quivering in every limb the ridge road i had taken placed us far in advance of the hound whose bay i could not now hear the struggles of the furious animal had become dreadful and every moment i could feel his sharp hooves cutting deep into my flesh my grasp upon his antlers was growing less and less firm and yet i relinquished not my hold the struggle had brought us near a deep ditch washed by the fall rains and into this i endeavoured to force my adversary but my strength was unequal to the effort when we approached to the very brink he leaped over the drain i relinquished my hold and rolled in hoping thus to escape him but he returned to the attack and throwing himself upon me inflicted numerous severe cuts upon my face and breast before i could again seize him locking my arms around his antlers i drew his head close to my breast and was thus by great effort enabled to prevent his doing me any serious injury but i felt that this could not last long every muscle and fibre of my frame was called into action and human nature could not long bear up under such exertion faltering a silent prayer to heaven i prepared to meet my fate at this moment of despair i heard the faint bayings of the hound the stag too heard the sound and springing from the ditch drew me with him his efforts were now redoubled and i could scarcely cling to him yet that blessed sound came nearer and nearer oh how wildly beat my heart as i saw the hound emerge from the ravine and spring forward with a short quick bark as his eye rested on his game i released my hold of the stag who turned upon the new enemy exhausted and unable to rise i still cheered the dog that dastard-like fled before the infuriated animal who seemingly despising such an enemy again threw himself upon me 
again did i succeed in throwing my arms around his antlers but not until he had inflicted several deep and dangerous wounds upon my head and face cutting to the very bone blinded by the flowing blood exhausted and despairing i cursed the coward dog who stood near baying furiously yet refusing to seize his game oh how i prayed for bravo the thoughts of death were bitter to die thus in the wild forest alone with none to help thoughts of home and friends coursed like lightning through my brain at that moment when hope herself had fled deep and clear over the neighbouring hill came the baying of my gallant bravo i should have known his voice among a thousand i pealed forth in one faint shout on bravo on the next moment with tiger-like bounds the noble dog came leaping down the declivity scattering the dried autumnal leaves like a whirlwind in his path no pause he knew but fixing his fangs at the stag's throat he at once commenced the struggle i fell back completely exhausted blinded with blood i only knew that a terrible struggle was going on in a few moments all was still and i felt the warm breath of my faithful dog as he licked my wounds clearing my eyes from gore i saw my late adversary dead at my feet and bravo my own bravo as the heroine of a modern novel would say standing over me he yet bore around his neck a fragment of the rope with which i had tied him he had gnawed it in two and following his master through all his windings arrived in time to rescue him from a horrible death i have recovered from my wounds bravo is lying at my feet who does not love bravo i am sure i do and the rascal knows it don't you bravo come here sir perilous escape from death in the narrative of moses van campen we find the following incident related he was taken prisoner by the seneca indians just after sullivan's expedition in the revolution on the confines of the white settlements in one of the border counties of pennsylvania he was marched through the wilderness and reached the headquarters of the savages near fort niagara here he was recognized as having a year or two previously escaped with two others from his guard five of whom he slew in their sleep with his own hand on this discovery being made the countenances of the savages grew dark and lowering he saw at once that his fate was to be decided on the principles of indian vengeance and being bound had but little hope of escape he however put on the appearance of as much unconcern as possible the indians withdrew by themselves to decide in what manner they should dispatch their unhappy victim they soon returned their visages covered with a demoniac expression a few went to gathering wood another selected a spot and soon a fire was kindled van campen looked upon these preparations which were being made to burn him alive with feelings wrought up to the highest pitch of agony yet he with much effort remained calm and collected at last when the preparations were completed two indians approached and began to unloose the cords with which he was bound to this he submitted but the moment he was fully loosed he dashed the two indians aside felling one upon the earth with a blow of his fist and darted off toward the fort where he hoped to receive protection from the british officers tomahawks gleamed in the air behind him rifle balls whistled around but onward still he flew one unarmed indian stood in his path and intercepted him with a giant spring he struck him in the breast with his feet and bore him to the earth recovering himself he again started for the woods and as he was running for life with the fire and faggot behind him and a lingering death of torture he soon outstripped all his pursuers it being near night he effected his escape arrived at the fort and was sent down the river to montreal to be out of the way of the savage senecas who thirsted for his blood as a recompense for that of their brethren whom he had slain fire in the forest the summer of eighteen twenty five was unusually warm in both hemispheres particularly in america where its effects were fatally visible in the prevalence of epidemical disorders 
during july and august extensive fires raged in different parts of nova scotia especially in the eastern division of the peninsula the protracted drought of the summer acting upon the aridity of the forest had rendered them more than naturally combustible and this facilitating both the dispersion and progress of the fires that appeared in the early part of the season produced an unusual warmth on the sixth of october the fire was evidently approaching newcastle at different intervals fitful blazes and flashes were observed to issue from different parts of the woods particularly up the northwest at the rear of newcastle in the vicinity of douglastown and moorfields and along the banks of bartabog many persons hearing the crackling of falling trees and shriveled branches while a hoarse rumbling sound not dissimilar to the roaring of distant thunder and divided by pauses like the intermittent discharges of artillery was distinct and audible on the seventh of october the heat increased to such a degree and became so very oppressive that many complained of its enervating effects about twelve o'clock a pale sickly mist lightly tinged with purple emerged from the forest and settled over it this cloud soon retreated before a large dark one which occupying its place wrapped the firmament in a pall of vapour this encumbrance retaining its position till about three o'clock the heat became tormentingly sultry there was not a breath of air the atmosphere was overloaded and irresistible lassitude seized the people a stupefying dullness seemed to pervade every place but the woods which now trembled and rustled and shook with an incessant and thrilling noise of explosions rapidly following each other and mingling their reports with a discordant variety of loud and boisterous sounds at this time the whole country appeared to be encircled by a fiery zone which gradually contracting its circle by the devastation it had made seemed as if it would not converge into a point while anything remained to be destroyed a little after four o'clock an immense pillar of smoke rose in a vertical direction at some distance northeast of newcastle for a while and the sky was absolutely blackened by this huge cloud but a light northerly breeze springing up it gradually distended and then dissipated into a variety of shapeless mists about an hour after or probably at half-past five innumerable large spires of smoke issuing from different parts of the woods and illuminated the flames that seemed to pierce them mounted the sky a heavy and suffocating canopy extending to the utmost verge of observation and appearing more terrific by the vivid flashes and blazes that darted irregularly through it now hung over newcastle and douglas in threatening suspension while showers of flaming brands calcined leaves ashes and cinders seemed to scream through the growling noise that prevailed in the woods about nine o'clock p m or shortly after a succession of loud and appalling roars thundered through the forests peal after peal crash after crash announced the sentence of destruction every succeeding shock created fresh alarm every clap came loaded with its own destructive energy with greedy rapidity did the flames advance to the devoted scene of their ministry nothing could impede their progress they removed every obstacle by the desolation they occasioned and several hundred miles of prostrate forest and smitten woods marked their devastating way the river tortured into violence by the hurricane foamed with rage and flung its boiling spray upon the land the thunder pealed along the vault of heaven the lightning appeared to rend the firmament for a moment all was still and a deep and awful silence reigned over everything all nature appeared to be hushed when suddenly a lengthened and sullen roar came booming through the forest driving a thousand massive and devouring flames before it then newcastle and douglastown and the whole northern side of the river extending from bartabog to the nashwak a distance of more than one hundred miles in length became enveloped in an immense sheet of flame that spread over nearly six thousand square miles 
that the reader may form a faint idea of the desolation and misery which no pen can describe he must picture to himself a large and rapid river thickly settled for one hundred miles or more on both sides of it he must also fancy four thriving towns two on each side of this river and then reflect that these towns and settlements were all composed of wooden houses stores stables and barns that these barns and stables were filled with crops and that the arrival of the fall importations had stocked the warehouses and stores with spirits powder and a variety of combustible articles as well as with the necessary supplies for the approaching winter he must then remember that the cultivated or settled part of the river is but a long narrow strip about a quarter of a mile wide lying between the river and almost interminable forest stretching along the very edge of its precincts and all around it extending his conception he will see the forests thickly expanding over more than six thousand square miles and absolutely parched into tinder by the protracted heat of a long summer let him then animate the picture by scattering countless tribes of wild animals and hundreds of domestic ones and even thousands of men in the interior having done all this he will have before him a feeble outline of the extent features and general circumstances of the country which in the course of a few hours was suddenly enveloped in fire a more ghastly or a more revolting picture of human misery cannot well be imagined the whole district of cultivated land was shrouded in the agonizing memorials of some dreadful deforming havoc the songs of gladness that formerly resounded through it were no longer heard for the voice of misery had hushed them nothing broke upon the ear but the accents of distress the eye saw nothing but ruin and desolation and death newcastle yesterday a flourishing town full of trade and spirit and containing nearly one thousand inhabitants was now a heap of smoking ruins and douglas town nearly one-third of its size was reduced to the same miserable condition of the two hundred and sixty houses and storehouses that composed the former but twelve remained and of the seventy that comprised the latter but six were left the confusion on board of one hundred and fifty large vessels then lying in the miramaki and exposed to imminent danger was terrible some burned to the water's edge others burning and the remainder occasionally on fire dispersed groups of half-famished half-naked and houseless creatures all more or less injured in their persons many lamenting the loss of some property or children or relations and friends were wandering through the country of the human bodies some were seen with their bowels protruding others with the flesh all consumed and the blackened skeletons smoking some with headless trunks and severed extremities some bodies were burned to cinders others reduced to ashes many bloated and swollen by suffocation and several lying in the last contorted position of convulsing torture brief and violent was their passage from life to death and rude and melancholy was their sepulchre unknelled uncoffined and unknown the immediate loss of life was upward of five hundred beings thousands of wild beasts too had perished in the woods and from their putrescent carcasses issued streams of effluvium and stench that formed contagious domes over the dismantled settlements domestic animals of all kinds lay dead and dying in different parts of the country myriads of salmon trout bass and other fish which poisoned by the alkali formed by the ashes precipitated into the river now lay dead or floundering and gasping on the scorched shores and beaches and the countless variety of wild fowl and reptiles shared a similar fate such was the violence of the hurricane that large bodies of ignited timber and portions of the trunks of trees and severed limbs and also parts of flaming buildings shingles boards and so forth were hurried along through the frowning heavens with terrible velocity outstripping the fleetest horses spreading destruction far in the advance thus cutting off retreat 
the shrieks of the affrighted inhabitants mingling with the discordant bellowing of cattle the neighing of horses the howling of dogs and the strange notes of distress and fright from other domestic animals strangely blending with the roar of the flames and the thunder of the tornado beggars description their only means of safety was the river to which there was a simultaneous rush seizing whatever was buoyant however inadequate many attempted to effect a crossing some succeeded others failed and were drowned one woman actually seized a bull by the tail just as he plunged into the river and was safely towed to the opposite shore those who were unable to make their escape across plunged into the water to their necks and by a constant application of water to the head while in this submerged condition escaped a dreadful burning in some portions of the country the cattle were nearly all destroyed whole crews of men camping in the interior and engaged in timber making were consumed such was the awful conflagration of eighteen twenty five on the miramake pirates of the red sea the commerce of the red sea has almost from time immemorial greatly suffered from the depredations of arab pirates who infest the entire coast the exploits of one individual is dwelt upon by his late confreres with particular enthusiasm and his career and deeds were of so extraordinary a character that we feel justified in giving the following brief detail of them as furnished by an english traveller this dreadful man rama ibn java the beau ideal of his order the personation of an arab sea robber was a native of a small village near jidda at an early period he commenced a mode of life congenial to his disposition and nature purchasing a boat he with a band of about twelve companions commenced his career as a pirate and in the course of a few months he had been so successful that he became the owner of a vessel of three hundred tons and manned with a lawless crew it was a part of his system to leave british vessels unmolested and he even affected to be on good terms with them we have heard an old officer describe his appearance he was then about forty-five years of age short in stature but with a figure compact and square a constitution vigorous and the characteristic qualities of his countrymen frugality and patience of fatigue several scars already seamed his face and the bone of his arm had been shattered by a matchlock ball when boarding a vessel it is a remarkable fact that the intermediate bones sloughed away and the arm connected only by flesh and muscle was still by means of a silver tube affixed around it capable of exertion rama was born to be the leader of the wild spirits around him with a sternness of purpose that awed those who were near him into a degree of dread which totally astonished those who had been accustomed to view the terms of equality in which the arab chiefs appear with their followers he exacted the most implicit obedience to his will and the manner in which he acted toward his son exhibits the length he was disposed to go with those who thwarted or did not act up to the spirit of his views the young man then a mere stripling had been dispatched to attack some boats but he was unsuccessful this dastard and son of a dog said the enraged father who had been watching the progress of the affair you return unharmed to tell me fling him over the side the chief was obeyed and but for a boat which by some chance was passing some miles astern he would have drowned of his existence the father for many months was wholly unconscious and how he was reconciled we never heard but during the interval he was never known to utter his name no cause it appears existed for a repetition of the punishment for while yet a youth he met the death his father would most have coveted for him he fell at the head of a party that was bravely storming a fort many other acts of cruelty are related of him having seized a small trading boat he plundered her and then fastened the crew five in number round the anchor suspended it from the bows cut the cable and let the anchor with its living burden sink to the bottom he once attacked a small town on the persian gulf in this town lived one abder roussel a personal friend of the narrator who related the visit of the pirates to his dwelling 
seized with a violent illness he was stretched on a pallet spread on the floor of his apartment his wife to whom he was devotedly attached was attending him his head placed in her lap a violent noise arose below the door was heavily assailed it yielded a sharp conflict took place shouting and a rushing on the staircase was heard and the pirates were in the apartment i read their purpose said abder to me in their looks but i was bedridden and could not raise a finger to save her for whose life i would have gladly forfeited my own rama the pirate captain approached her entreaties for life were unavailing yet for an instant her extreme beauty arrested his arm but it was only for an instant his dagger again gleamed on high and she sank a bleeding victim beside me cold and apparently inanimate as i was i nevertheless felt her warm blood flowing past me and with her life it ebbed rapidly away my eyes must have been fixed with the vacant look of death i even felt unmoved as he bent down beside me and with spider-like fingers stripped the jewels from my hand the touch of that villain who had deprived me of all which in life i valued at length a happy insensibility stole over me how long i remained in this condition i know not but when i recovered my senses fever had left me cool blood again traversed my veins beside me was a faithful slave who was engaged bathing my temples he had escaped the slaughter by secreting himself while the murderers remained in the house rama although a man of few words with his crew was nevertheless very communicative to our officers whenever he fell in with them according to his own account he managed them by never permitting any familiarities nor communicating big plans and by an impartial distribution of plunder but the grand secret he knew full well was in his utter contempt of danger and that terrible untaught eloquence at the hour of need where time is brief and sentences must be condensed into words which marked his career success crowned all his exploits he made war and levied contributions on whom he pleased several times he kept important seaport towns in a state of blockade and his appearance was everywhere feared and dreaded he took possession of a small sandy islet not many miles from his native place where he built a fort and would occasionally sally forth and plunder and annoy any vessel that he met with although now perfectly blind and wounded in almost every part of his body yet such was the dread inspired by the energy of this old chief that for a long time no one could be found willing to attack the single vessel which he possessed at length a sheikh older than his neighbors proceeded in three heavy boats to attack rama the followers of the latter too well trained to feel or express alarm save that which arose from affection for their chief painted in strong terms the overwhelming superiority of the approaching force and counseled his bearing away from them but he spurned the idea the evening drew near and closed upon him after a severe contest they gained the deck an instant after dead and dying the victor and the vanquished were given to the wind rama with a spirit in accordance with the tenor of his whole career finding the day was going against him was led by a little boy to the magazine and then it is supposed applied the pipe he had been smoking during the action to the powder such to his life was the fitting end of the pirate chief end of section seventeen Section 18 of Thrilling Adventures by Land and Sea by James O. Brayman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 18. General Jackson and Weatherford. After the Battle of Tallapoosa, General Jackson returned with his victorious army to Fort Williams, but determined to give his enemy no opportunity of retrieving the misfortune that had befallen him, he recommenced operations immediately afterward on the seventh of april eighteen fourteen he again set out for tallapoosa with the view of forming a junction with the georgia troops under colonel milton and completing the subjugation of the country 
on the fourteenth of that month the union of the two armies was effected and both bodies moved to a place called the hickory ground where it was expected the last final stand would be made by the indians or terms of submission would be agreed on the principal chiefs of the different tribes had assembled here and on the approach of the army sent a deputation to treat for peace among them was weatherford celebrated equally for his talents and cruelty who had directed the massacre at fort mims it had been the intention of general jackson to inflict a signal punishment upon him if ever in his power struck however with the bold and nervous eloquence of the fearless savage and persuaded of the sincerity of his wishes for peace he dismissed him without injury some of the speeches of this warrior have been preserved and exhibit a beautiful specimen of the melancholy but manly tone of a savage hero lamenting the misfortunes of his race addressing general jackson he said i am in your power do with me as you please i am a soldier i have done the white people all the harm i could i have fought them and fought them bravely there was a time when i had a choice and could have answered you i have none now even hope is ended once i could animate my warriors but i cannot animate the dead my warriors can no longer hear my voice their bones are at talladega talishatchee imakfal and tohokapika while there was a chance of success i never left my post nor supplicated peace but my people are gone and i now ask it for my nation and myself he shortly afterward became the instrument of restoring peace which was concluded by the total submission of the indians they agreed to retire in the rear of the army and occupy the country to the east of the coosa while a line of american posts was established from tennessee and georgia to the alabama and the power and resources of these tribes were thus effectually destroyed cruise of the saldana and talbot at midnight of saturday the thirtieth of november eighteen eleven with a fair wind and a smooth sea we weighed from our station in company with the saldana frigate of thirty-eight guns captain peckenham with a crew of three hundred men on a cruise as was intended of twenty days the saldana taking a westerly course while we stood in the opposite direction we had scarcely got out of the lock and cleared the heads however when we plunged at once into all the miseries of a gale of wind blowing from the west during the three following days it continued to increase in violence when the islands of call and terry became visible to us as the wind had now chopped round more to the north and continued unabated in violence the danger of getting involved among the numerous small islands and rugged headlands on the northwest coast of Inverness became evident it was therefore deemed expedient to wear the ship round and make a port with all expedition with this view and favoured by the wind a course was shaped for loxwilly and away we scudded under close reefed foresail and main topsail followed by a tremendous sea which threatened every moment to overwhelm us and accompanied by piercing showers of hail and a gale which blew with incredible fury the same course was steered until next day about noon when land was seen on the lee bow the weather being thick some time elapsed before it could be distinctly made out and it was then ascertained to be the island of north arran on the coast of donegal westward of loxwilly the ship was therefore hauled up some points and we yet entertained hopes of reaching an anchorage before nightfall when the weather gradually thickened and the sea now that we were upon the wind broke over us in all directions its violence was such that in a few minutes several of our ports were stove in at which the water poured in in great abundance until it was actually breast high on the lee side of the main deck fortunately but little got below and the ship was relieved by taking in the foresail but a dreadful addition was now made to the precariousness of our situation by the cry of land ahead which was seen from the forecastle and must have been very near not a moment was now lost in wearing the ship round on the other tack and making what little sail could be carried to weather the land we had already passed this soon proved however to be a forlorn prospect for it was found that we should run our distance by ten o'clock 
all the horrors of shipwreck now stared us in the face aggravated tenfold by the darkness of the night and the tremendous force of the wind which now blew a hurricane mountains are insignificant when speaking of the sea that kept pace with it its violence was awful beyond description and it frequently broke over all the poor little ship that shivered and groaned but behaved admirably the force of the sea may be guessed from the fact of the sheet anchor nearly a ton and a half in weight being actually lifted on board to say nothing of the four chain plates board broken both gangways torn away quarter galleries stove in and so forth in short on getting into port the vessel was found to be loosened through all her frame and leaking at every seam as far as depended on her good qualities however i felt assured at the time we were safe for i had seen enough of the talbot to be convinced we were in one of the finest sea-boats that ever swam but what could all the skill of the shipbuilder avail in a situation like ours with the night full fifteen hours long before us and knowing that we were fast driving on the land anxiety and dread were on every face and every mind felt the terrors of uncertainty and suspense at length about twelve o'clock the dreadful truth was disclosed to us judge of my sensation when i saw the frowning rocks of aaron scarcely half a mile distant on our lee bow to our inexpressible relief and not less to our surprise we fairly weathered all and were congratulating each other on our escape when on looking forward i imagined i saw breakers at no great distance on our lee and this suspicion was soon confirmed when the moon which shone at intervals suddenly broke out from behind a cloud and presented to us a most terrific spectacle at not more than a quarter of a mile's distance on our lee beam appeared a range of tremendous breakers among which it seemed as if every sea would throw us their height it may be guessed was prodigious when they could be clearly distinguished from the foaming waters of the surrounding ocean it was a scene seldom to be witnessed and never forgotten lord have mercy upon us was now on the lip of every one destruction seemed inevitable captain swain whose coolness i have never seen surpassed issued his orders clearly and collectedly when it was proposed as a last resource to drop the anchors cut away the masts and trust to the chance of riding out the gale this scheme was actually determined on and everything was in readiness but happily was deferred until an experiment was tried aloft in addition to the close-reefed main topsail and foresail the fore topsail and trysail were now set and the result was almost magical with a few plunges we cleared not only the reef but a huge rock upon which i could with ease have tossed a biscuit and in a few minutes we were inexpressibly rejoiced to see both far astern we had now miraculously escaped all but certain destruction a second time but much was yet to be feared we had still to pass cape jeller and the moments dragged on in gloomy apprehension and anxious suspense the ship carried sail most wonderfully and we continued to go along at the rate of seven knots shipping very heavy seas and laboring much all with much solicitude looking out for daylight the dawn at length appeared and to our great joy we saw the land several miles astern having passed the cape and many other hidden dangers during the darkness matters on the morning of the fifth assumed a very different aspect from that which we had experienced for the last two days the wind gradually subsided and with it the sea and a favourable breeze now springing up we were enabled to make a good offing fortunately no accident of consequence occurred although several of our people were severely bruised by falls poor fellows they certainly suffered enough not a dry stitch not a dry hammock have they had since we sailed happily however their misfortunes are soon forgot in a dry shirt and a can of grog the most melancholy part of the narrative is still to be told on coming up to our anchorage we observed an unusual degree of curiosity and bustle in the fort crowds of people were congregated on both sides running to and fro examining us through spy-glasses in short an extraordinary commotion was apparent 
the meaning of all this was but too soon made known to us by a boat coming alongside from which we learned that the unfortunate saldana had gone to pieces and every man perished our own destruction had likewise been reckoned inevitable from the time of the discovery of the unhappy fate of our consort five days beforehand and hence the astonishment at our unexpected return from all that could be learned concerning the dreadful catastrophe i am inclined to believe that the saldana had been driven on the rocks about the time our doom appeared so certain in another quarter her lights were seen by the signal tower at nine o'clock of that fearful wednesday night december fourth after which it is supposed she went ashore on the rocks at a small bay called valley Masticker, almost at the entrance of loxwilly harbour next morning the beach was strewed with fragments of the wreck and upward of two hundred of the bodies of the unfortunate sufferers were washed ashore one man and one only out of the three hundred was ascertained to have come ashore alive but almost in a state of insensibility unhappily there was no person present to administer to his wants judiciously and upon craving something to drink about half a pint of whisky was given him by the people which almost instantly killed him poor peckenham's body was recognized amid the others and like these stripped quite naked by the inhuman wretches who flocked to the wreck as to a blessing it is even suspected that he came on shore alive but was stripped and left to perish nothing could equal the audacity of the plunderers although a party of the lanark militia was doing duty around the wreck but this is an ungracious and revolting subject which no one of proper feeling would wish to dwell upon still less am i inclined to describe the heart-rending scene at bunkrana where the widows of many of the sufferers are residing the surgeon's wife a native of halifax has never spoken since the dreadful tidings arrived consolation is inadmissible and no one has yet ventured to offer it a carob's revenge in a work recently published in london by captain millman are to be found some of the most thrilling scenes from life in the tropics it has ever been our fortune to meet with the following account of a carob's revenge on a sea captain named jack diver on one of the narrow mountain paths of guadeloupe is exceedingly graphic and forcible while he was making up his mind a dark figure had stolen unperceived close behind him with a small basket in his hand of split reeds out of which came a low buzzing murmuring sound he lay down quietly across the path at the point of the first angle of the elbow of the mountain spar not many feet from the hind legs of the horse jack diver with a scowling look turned his horse round with some difficulty it plunged and reared slightly but went on occupied with retaining his seat the master of the transport scarcely perceived the figure lying in the path he could not see who it was for the face of the man was toward the ground but the horse saw it at once the animal accustomed to mountain roads from its birth had often stepped over both men and animals which are sometimes forced in the narrowest parts to lie down to let the heavier and stronger pass in that highly dangerous and disagreeable method lifted his feet cautiously one by one so as not to tread on the prostrate figure as the horse was above him the man lifted with one hand the lid of the basket and a swarm of wasps flew suddenly out buzzing and humming fiercely and in a moment they began to settle on the moving object the horse commenced switching his tail to drive them away pricking up his ears and snorting with terror the man on the path lay quite still until they had thus moved on a few yards and then he raised his head a little and watched them with his keen black eyes the wasps driven off for a moment became only the more irritated and returned with vigour and wonderful pertinacity to the attack beginning to sting the poor animal furiously in all the tender parts they assailed the wretched master in his turn darting their venomed barbs into his face and hands and driving him nearly frantic 
the horse plunged furiously and jack diver losing his stirrups and his presence of mind together twisted his hands into the horse's mane to keep his seat letting the reins fall on his neck at last with a rear and a bound into the air the maddened animal darted off at a gallop but the faster he went the closer stuck the persevering wasps jack diver shut his eyes screaming with fear and pain then the carob chief rose up and again the hawk-like scream echoed along the valley the turn is to be made can the horse recover himself yes maddened as he is he sees the danger instinctively his speed slackens he throws himself on his haunches with his four feet on the very brink of the precipice one more chance the blind infatuated man remains on his back again the horse feels the stings of his deadly persecutors again he plunges forward striving to turn quickly round the corner round and he is in comparative safety on a sudden from behind a buttress of projecting rock there start across the path three dusky forms flinging their hands wildly in the air then was heard that rare and awful sound the shriek of a horse in the fear of a certain and coming death when swerving one side he lost his footing on the slippery shelf and struggling madly but unsuccessfully to recover it he fell over and over down and down a thousand feet down from the sailor's lips there came no cry massacre of fort mims on the thirtieth of august eighteen thirteen fort mims which contained one hundred and fifty men under the command of major beasley besides a number of women and children was surprised by a party of indians the houses were set on fire and those who escaped the flames fell victims to the tomahawk neither age nor sex was spared and the most horrible cruelties of which the imagination can conceive were perpetrated out of the three hundred persons which the fort contained only seventeen escaped to carry the dreadful intelligence to the neighboring stations this sanguinary and unprovoked massacre excited universal horror and the desire of revenge the state of tennessee immediately took active measures for punishing the aggressors general jackson was ordered to draft two thousand of the militia and volunteers of his division and general coffee was directed to proceed with five hundred mounted men to the frontier of the state the former having collected a part of his force joined general coffee on the twelfth of october at ditto's landing on the tennessee they then marched to the ten islands in the same river a few days afterward general coffee was detached with nine hundred men to attack a body of the enemy posted at talajachi he arrived early in the morning within a short distance of it and dividing his force into two columns completely surrounded it the indians for a long time made a desperate resistance and did all that was possible for men to do who were in their situation but they were finally overpowered with the loss of one hundred and eighty-six men the freshet the freshet at bangor maine in the spring of eighteen forty six is thus described in forest life and forest trees the first injury to the city was from the breaking away of a small section of the jam which came down and pressed against the ice on our banks by this twenty houses in one immediate neighborhood on the west bank of the river alone were at once inundated but without loss of life this occurred in the daytime and presented a scene of magnificent interest the effect of this small concussion upon the ice near the city was terrific the water rose instantly to such a height as to sweep the buildings and lumber from the ends of the wharves and to throw up the ice in huge sheets and pyramids this shock was resisted by the great covered bridge on the penobscot which is about one thousand feet in length and thus gave time to save much property but meanwhile another auxiliary to the fearful work had been preparing by the breaking up of the ice in the kenuskig river this river flows through the heart of the city dividing it into two equal portions the whole flat on the margin of the river is covered with stores and public buildings and is the place of merchandise for the city 
the kenduskeeg runs nearly at right angles with the penobscot at the point where they unite the penobscot skirts the city on the eastern side and on the banks of this river are the principal wharves for the deposit of lumber i must mention another circumstance to give you a just idea of our situation there is a narrow spot in the river about a mile below the city at high head in which is a shoal and from which the greatest danger of a jam always arises and it was this that caused the principal inundation the next incident occurred at midnight when the bells were rung to announce the giving way of the ice it was a fearful sound and scene the streets were thronged with men women and children who rushed abroad to witness the approach of the icy avalanche at length it came rushing on with a power that a thousand locomotives in a body could not buy with but it was veiled from the sight by the darkness of a hazy night and the ear only could trace its progress by the sounds of crashing buildings lumber and whatever it encountered in its pathway except the glimpses that could be caught of it by the light of hundreds of torches and lanterns that threw their glare upon the misty atmosphere the jam passed on and a portion of it pressed through the weakest portion of the great bridge and thus joining the ice below the bridge pressed it down to the narrows at high head the destruction meanwhile was in progress on the kenduskeeg which poured down its tributary ice sweeping mills bridges shops and other buildings with masses of logs and lumber to add to the common wreck at that moment the anxiety and suspense were fearful whether the jam would force its way through the narrows or there stop and pour back a flood of waters upon the city for it was from the rise of the water consequent upon such a jam that the great destruction was to be apprehended but the suspense was soon over a cry was heard from the dense mass of citizens who crowded the streets on the flat the river is flowing back and so sudden was the revulsion that it required the utmost speed to escape the rising waters it seemed but a moment before the entire flat was deluged and many men did not escape from their stores before the water was up to their waists had you witnessed the scene occurring as it did in the midst of a dark and hazy night and had you heard the rushing of the waters and the crash of the ruins and seen the multitudes retreating in a mass from the returning flood illumined only by the glare of torches and lanterns and listening to the shouts and cries that escaped from them to give the alarm to those beyond you would not be surprised at my being reminded of the host of pharaoh as they fled and sent up their cry from the red sea as it returned upon them in its strength the closing scene of this dreadful disaster occurred on sunday evening beginning at about seven o'clock the alarm was again rung through the streets that the jam had given way the citizens again rushed abroad to witness what they knew must be one of the most sublime and awful scenes of nature and also to learn the full extent of their calamity few however were able to catch a sight of the breaking up of the jam which for magnitude it is certain has not occurred on this river for more than one hundred years the whole river was like a boiling cauldron with masses of ice upheaved as by a volcano but soon the darkness shrouded the scene in part the ear however could hear the roaring of the waters and the crash of buildings bridges and lumber and the eye could trace the mammoth ice jam of four miles long which passed on majestically but with lightning rapidity bearing the contents of both rivers on its bosom the noble covered bridge of the penobscot two bridges of the kenduskeeg and the two long ranges of sawmills besides other mills houses shops logs and lumber enough to build up a considerable village the new market floated over the lower bridge across the kenduskeeg a part of which remains and most happily landed at a point of the wharves where it sunk and formed the nucleus of a sort of boom which stopped the masses of floating lumber in the kenduskeeg and protected thousands of dollars worth of lumber on the wharves below End of section eighteen
Section 19 of Thrilling Adventures by Land and Sea by James O. Brayman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 19. The Panther's Den. The occupants of a few log cabins in the vicinity of the Bayou Manlat, a tributary of the noble Bay of Pensacola, situated in the western part of the then territory of Florida, had been for some weeks annoyed by the mysterious disappearance of the cattle and goats which constituted almost the only wealth of these rude countrymen and the belated herdsman was frequently startled by the terrible half-human cry of the dreaded panther and the next morning some one of the squatters would find himself minus a number of cloven feet about this time i happened into the settlement on a hunting excursion in company with another son of nimrod and learning the state of affairs resolved if possible to rid the clearing of its pest and bind new laurels to our brows the night before our arrival a heifer had been killed within a few rods of the cabin and the carcass dragged off toward the swamp some two miles distant leaving a broad trail to mark the destroyer's path this being pointed out to us ned and myself resolved to execute our enterprise without delay this was to beard the lion in his den having carefully charged our rifles and pistols and seen that our bowies were as keen as razors we set out on the trail which soon brought us to the edge of the bayou manlet swamp which covers a surface of some thousands of acres being a dense muddy hammock of tetty bay magnolia cane grapevines and so forth a perpetual twilight reigned beneath the dense foliage supported by the rank soil and our hearts beat a few more pulsations to the minute as we left the scorching glare of the noonday sun and plunged into the gloomy fastnesses of the bear and alligator to these latter gentlemen whose clumsy forms were sprawling through the mud on every side we gave no further heed other than to keep without the range of the deadly sweep of their powerful tails with which they bring their unsuspecting prey within reach of their saw-like jaws the bears we did not happen to meet or we should most assuredly have given them some of the balls designed for the panthers well we followed the trail half a mile into the swamp when on an elevated spot we suddenly encountered the half-devoured body of the unfortunate heifer apparently just deserted by the captors we cautiously advanced a few paces further over a pavement of bones clean scraped and meatless and entered an open space when a sight met my eyes which certainly made me wish myself safe at home or in fact anywhere else but where i was about twenty-five feet from us we saw instead of one an old she-panther and two cubs nearly grown while directly over them on the blasted and sloping trunk of an immense gum tree crouched the old he one of all lashing his sides fiercely with his tail and snorting and spitting like an enraged cat an example which was imitated by the three below here was a dilemma on the particularly sharp horns of which we found ourselves most uncomfortably situated to retreat would induce an immediate attack the consequence of an advance would be ditto so we stood en tableau for a brief second our guns cocked and aimed ned drawing a bead on the dam while i did the same on the sire it seemed madness to fire we were not long uncertain as to our course for the old fellow suddenly bounded from the trunk upon me with a deafening roar i fired as he sprang and the report of my piece was re-echoed by that of ned's i sprang aside dropping my rifle and drawing my long and heavy knife it was well i did so for the mortally wounded beast alighted on the very spot i had left he turned and sprang upon me i avoided the blow of its powerful paw and grappling with him i rolled on the turf winding my right arm tight around his neck and hugging close to his body to avoid his teeth and claws while i dealt rapid thrusts with my knife i was very powerful but never was in a situation where i felt more sensibly the need of exerting all my muscle the contest was soon decided my knife passed through the brute's heart and panting from the dreadful close and breathless all the champion rose 
and it was full time that i should do so for ned having put a ball through the head of the dam was now manfully battling with her two cubs the poor fellow was sorely pressed streaming with blood from numberless scratches and almost in a state of nature for the sharp claws of the cubs had literally undressed him by piecemeal his savage assailants also bore upon their bloody hides numerous tokens of his prowess in wielding his bowie their system of attack seemed to be to spring suddenly upon him striking with their paws and as they did so in most instances simultaneously it was impossible for him to defend himself strong and active as he was and had no assistance been at hand they would undoubtedly have gained the victory it was a brave sight though to see the tall strong hunter meeting their attacks undauntedly standing with his left arm raised to defend his head and throat and darting his knife into their tough bodies as he threw them from him but to meet the next moment their renewed efforts for his destruction all this i caught at one glance as i rushed to his rescue ned shouted i mad and reckless with excitement take the one on your left and we threw ourselves upon them i met my antagonist in his onward leap and making a desperate blow at him my wrist struck his paw and the knife flew far from my hand there was nothing else for me but to seize him by the loose skin of the neck with both hands and hold on like grim death keeping him at arm's length while his paws beat a tattoo to a double quick time on my breast and body stripping my garments into ribbons in a most workmanlike manner and ornamenting my sensitive skin with a variety of lines and characters done in red a process which i did not care to prolong however beyond a period when i could soonest put a stop to the operation as i was debating how to attain so desirable an end the remembrance of the small rifle pistol in my belt and which till now in the hurry of the conflict i had forgotten suddenly flashed upon my mind and disengaging one hand i drew it forth cocked it with my thumb and the next moment the panther's brains were spattered in my face i turned to look for ned and found him trying to free himself from the dead body of the panther whose teeth were fastened in their death grip to the small remnant of his hunting coat which hung around his neck i separated the strip of cloth with my recovered knife and we sank panting to the ground while our hearts went up in thankfulness for deliverance from so imminent danger to life and limb after resting a while we washed the blood our blood from our bodies and decorated them with what was left somewhat after the fashion of the indian who wears only a breech clout we took the scalps of the four panthers and started on our homeward march our success was speedily known in the clearing and in the evening a barbecue was had in our honour to furnish which a relation of the unfortunate heifer met with a fate scarcely less terrible this exploit added not little to our reputation among the hunter folk adventure with elephants on the twenty seventh as day dawned says mr cumming i left my shooting hole and proceeded to inspect the spoor of my wounded rhinoceros after following it for some distance i came to an abrupt hillock and fancying that from the summit a good view might be obtained of the surrounding country i left my followers to seek the spoor while i ascended i did not raise my eyes from the ground until i had reached the highest pinnacle of rock i then looked east and to my inexpressible gratification beheld a troop of nine or ten elephants quietly browsing within a quarter of a mile of me i allowed myself only one glance at them and then rushed down to warn my followers to be silent a council of war was hastily held the result of which was my ordering isaac to ride hard to camp with instructions to return as quickly as possible accompanied by kleinboy and to bring me my dogs the large dutch rifle and a fresh horse i once more ascended the hillock to feast my eyes upon the enchanting sight before me and drawing out my spy-glass narrowly watched the motions of the elephants the herd consisted entirely of females several of which were followed by small calves 
presently on reconnoitering the surrounding country i discovered a second herd consisting of five bull elephants which were quietly feeding about a mile to the northward the cows were feeding toward a rocky ridge that stretched away from the base of the hillock on which i stood burning with impatience to commence the attack i resolved to try the stalking system with these and to hunt the troop of bulls with dogs and horses having thus decided i directed the guides to watch the elephants from the summit of the hillock and with a beating heart i approached them the ground and wind favoring me i soon gained the rocky ridge toward which they were feeding they were now within one hundred yards and i resolved to enjoy the pleasure of watching their movements for a little before i fired they continued to feed slowly toward me breaking the branches from the trees with their trunks and eating the leaves and tender shoots i soon selected the finest in the herd and kept my eye on her in particular at length two of the troop had walked slowly past at about sixty yards and the one which i had selected was feeding with two others on a thorny tree before me my hand was now as steady as the rock on which it rested so taking a deliberate aim i let fly at her head a little behind the eye she got it hard and sharp just where i aimed but it did not seem to affect her much uttering a loud cry she wheeled about when i gave her the second ball close behind the shoulder all the elephants uttered a strange rumbling noise and made off in a line to the northward at a brisk ambling pace their huge fan-like ears flapping in the ratio of their speed i did not wait to load but ran back to the hillock to obtain a view on gaining its summit the guides pointed out the elephants they were standing in a grove of shady trees but the wounded one was some distance behind with another elephant doubtless its particular friend who was endeavouring to assist it these elephants had probably never before heard the report of a gun and having neither seen nor smelt me they were unaware of the presence of man and did not seem inclined to go any further presently my men hove in sight bringing the dogs and when these came up i waited some time before commencing the attack that the dogs and horses might recover their wind we then rode slowly toward the elephants and had advanced within two hundred yards of them when the ground being open they observed us and made off in an easterly direction but the wounded one immediately dropped astern and the next moment was surrounded by the dogs which barking angrily seemed to engross all her attention having placed myself between her and the retreating troop i dismounted to fire within forty yards of her in open ground colesberg was extremely afraid of the elephants and gave me much trouble jerking my arm when i tried to fire at length i let fly but on endeavouring to regain my saddle colesberg declined to allow me to mount and when i tried to lead him and run for it he only backed toward the wounded elephant at this moment i heard another elephant close behind and looking about i beheld the friend with uplifted trunk charging down upon me at top speed shrilly trumpeting and following an old black pointer named schwart that was perfectly deaf and trotted along before the enraged elephant quite unaware of what was behind him i felt certain that she would have either me or my horse i however determined not to relinquish my steed but to hold on by the bridle my men who of course kept at a safe distance stood aghast with their mouths open and for a few seconds my position was certainly not an enviable one fortunately however the dogs took off the attention of the elephants and just as they were upon me i managed to spring into the saddle where i was safe as i turned my back to mount the elephants were so very near that i really expected to feel one of their trunks lay hold of me i rode up to kleinboy for my double-barreled two-grooved rifle he and isaac were pale and almost speechless with fright returning to the charge i was soon once more alongside and firing from the saddle i sent another brace of bullets into the wounded elephant colesberg was extremely unsteady and destroyed the correctness of my aim the friend now seemed resolved to do some mischief and charged me furiously pursuing me to a distance of several hundred yards 
i therefore deemed it proper to give her a gentle hint to act less officiously and accordingly having loaded i approached within thirty yards and gave it her sharp right and left behind the shoulder upon which she at once made off with drooping trunk evidently with a mortal wound i never recur to this day's elephant shooting without regretting my folly in contenting myself with securing only one elephant the first was now dying and could not leave the ground and the second was also mortally wounded and i had only to follow and finish her but i foolishly allowed her to escape while i amused myself with the first which kept walking backward and standing by every tree she passed two more shots finished her on receiving them she tossed her trunk up and down two or three times and falling on her broadside against a thorny tree which yielded like grass before her enormous weight she uttered a deep hoarse cry and expired this was a very handsome old cow elephant and was decidedly the best in the troop she was in excellent condition and carried a pair of long and perfect tusks i was in high spirits at my success and felt so perfectly satisfied with having killed one that although it was still early in the day and my horses were fresh i allowed the troop of five bulls to remain unmolested foolishly trusting to fall in with them next day the shark sentinel with my companion one beautiful afternoon rambling over the rocky cliffs at the back of the island new providence west indies we came to a spot where the stillness and the clear transparency of the water invited us to bathe it was not deep as we stood above on the promontory we could see the bottom in every part under the headland which formed the opposite side of the cove there was a cavern to which as the shore was steep there was no access but by swimming and we resolved to explore it we soon reached its mouth and were enchanted with its romantic grandeur and wild beauty it extended we found a long way back and had several natural baths into all of which we successively threw ourselves each as they receded further from the mouth of the cavern being colder than the last the tide it was evident had free ingress and renewed the water every twelve hours here we thoughtlessly amused ourselves for some time at length the declining sun warned us that it was time to take our departure from the cave when at no great distance from us we saw the back or dorsal fin of a monstrous shark above the surface of the water and his whole length visible beneath it we looked at him and at each other in dismay hoping that he would soon take his departure and go in search of other prey but the rogue swam to and fro just like a frigate blockading an enemy's port the sentinel paraded before us about ten or fifteen yards in front of the cave tack and tack waiting only to serve one if not both of us as we should have served a shrimp or an oyster we had no intention however in this as in other instances of throwing ourselves on the mercy of the court in vain did we look for relief from other quarters the promontory above us was inaccessible the tide was rising and the sun touching the clear blue edge of the horizon i being the leader pretended to a little knowledge in ichthyology and told my companion that fish could hear as well as see and that therefore the less we said the better and the sooner we retreated out of his sight the sooner he would take himself off this was our only chance and that a poor one for the flow of the water would soon have enabled him to enter the cave and help himself as he seemed perfectly acquainted with the locale and knew that we had no mode of retreat but by the way we came we drew back out of sight and i don't know when i ever passed a more unpleasant quarter of an hour a suit in chancery or even a spring lounge at nougat would have been almost a luxury to what i felt when the shades of night began to darken the mouth of our cave and this infernal monster continued to parade like a water bailiff before its door 
at last not seeing the shark's fin above the water i made a sign to charles that cost what it might we must swim for it for we had notice to quit by the tide and if we did not depart should soon have an execution in the house we had been careful not to utter a word and silently pressing each other by the hand we slipped into the water and recommending ourselves to providence struck out manfully i must own i never felt more assured of destruction not even when i once swam through the blood of a poor sailor while the sharks were eating him for the sharks then had something to occupy them but this one had nothing else to do but to look after us we had the benefit of his undivided attention my sensations were indescribably horrible i may occasionally write or talk of the circumstance with levity but whenever i recall it to mind i tremble at the bare recollection of the dreadful fate that seemed inevitable my companion was not so expert a swimmer as i was so that i distanced him many feet when i heard him utter a faint cry i turned round convinced that the shark had seized him but it was not so my having left him so far behind had increased his terror and induced him to draw my attention i returned to him held him up and encouraged him without this he would certainly have sunk he revived with my help and we reached the sandy beach in safety having eluded our enemy who when he neither saw nor heard us had as i concluded he would quitted the spot once more on terra firma we lay gasping for some minutes before we spoke what my companion's thoughts were i do not know mine were replete with gratitude to god and renewed vows of amendment and i have every reason to think that although charles had not so much room for reform as myself that his feelings were perfectly in unison with my own we never repeated this amusement though we frequently talked of our escape and laughed at our terrors yet on these occasions our conversation always took a serious turn and upon the whole i am convinced that this adventure did us both a vast deal of good hunting the tiger a gentleman in the civil service of the british east india company relates the following when a tiger springs on an elephant the latter is generally able to shake him off under his feet and then woe be to him the elephant either kneels on him and crutches him at once or gives him a kick which breaks half his ribs and sends him flying perhaps twenty paces the elephants however are often dreadfully torn and a large old tiger clings too fast to be thus dealt with in this case it often happens that the elephant himself falls from pain or from the hope of rolling on his enemy and the people on his back are in very considerable danger both from friends and foes the scratch of a tiger is sometimes venomous as that of a cat is said to be but this does not often happen and in general persons wounded by his teeth or claws if not killed outright recover easily enough i was at jaffna at the northern extremity of the island of ceylon in the beginning of the year eighteen nineteen when one morning my servant called me an hour or two before my usual time with master master people sent for master's dogs tiger in the town now my dogs chanced to be some very degenerate specimens of a fine species called the polygar dog which i should designate as a sort of wiry-haired greyhound without scent i kept them to hunt jackals but tigers are very different things by the way there are no real tigers in ceylon but leopards and panthers are always called so and by ourselves as well as by the natives this turned out to be a panther my gun chanced not to be put together and while my servant was doing it the collector and two medical men who had recently arrived came to my door the former armed with a fowling piece and the latter with remarkably blunt hog spears they insisted upon setting off without waiting for my gun a proceeding not much to my taste the tiger i must continue to call him so had taken refuge in a hut the roof of which as those of ceylon huts in general spread to the ground like an umbrella the only aperture into it was a small door about four feet high the collector wanted to get the tiger out at once 
i beg to wait for my gun but no the fowling piece loaded with ball of course and the two hog spears were quite enough i got a hedge stake and awaited my fate from very shame at this moment to my great delight there arrived from the fort an english officer two artillerymen and a melee captain and a pretty figure we should have cut without them as the event will show i was now quite ready to attack and my gun came a minute afterward the whole scene which follows took place within an enclosure about twenty feet square formed on three sides by a strong fence of palmyra leaves and on the fourth by the hut at the door of this the two artillerymen planted themselves and the melee captain got on the top to frighten the tiger out by worrying it an easy operation as the huts there are covered with coconut leaves one of the artillerymen wanted to go in to the tiger but we would not suffer it at last the beast sprang this man received him on his bayonet which he thrust apparently down his throat firing his piece at the same moment the bayonet broke off short leaving less than three inches on the musket the rest remained in the animal but was invisible to us the shot probably went through his cheek for it certainly did not seriously injure him as he instantly rose upon his legs with a loud roar and placed his paws upon the soldier's breast at this moment the animal appeared to me to about reach the centre of the man's face but i had scarcely time to observe this when the tiger stooping his head seized the soldier's arm in his mouth turned him half round staggering threw him over on his back and fell upon him our dread now was that if we fired upon the tiger we might kill the man for a moment there was a pause when his comrade attacked the beast exactly in the same manner as the gallant fellow himself had done he struck his bayonet into his head the tiger rose at him he fired and this time the ball took effect and in the head the animal staggered backward and we all poured in our fire he still kicked and writhed when the gentleman with the hog spears advanced and fixed him while the natives finished him by beating him on the head with hedge stakes the brave artilleryman was after all but slightly hurt he claimed the skin which was very cheerfully given to him there was however a cry among the natives that the head should be cut off it was and in so doing the knife came directly across the bayonet the animal measured scarcely less than four feet from the root of the tail to the muzzle there was no tradition of a tiger having been in jaffna before indeed this one must have either come a distance of almost twenty miles or have swam across an arm of the sea nearly two in breadth for jaffna stands on a peninsula on which there is no jungle of any magnitude End of section nineteen. Section 20 of Thrilling Adventures by Land and Sea by James O. Brayman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 20. Indian Devil. There is an animal in the deep recesses of the forests of Maine, evidently belonging to the feline race, which, on account of its ferocity, is significantly called Indian Devil, in the Indian language the Lunxus a terror to the indians and the only animal in new england of which they stand in dread you may speak of the moose the bear and the wolf even and the red man is ready for the chase and the encounter but name the object of his dread and he will significantly shake his head while he exclaims he all one devil an individual by the name of smith met with the following adventure in an encounter with one of these animals on the aramukto while on his way to join a crew engaged in timber-making in the woods he had nearly reached the place of encampment when he came suddenly upon one of these ferocious animals there was no chance for retreat neither had he time for reflection on the best method of defence or escape as he had no arms or other weapons of defence 
his first impulse in this truly fearful position unfortunately perhaps was to spring into a small tree near by but he had scarcely ascended his length when the desperate creature probably rendered still more fierce by the promptings of hunger sprang upon and seized him by the heel smith however after having his foot badly bitten disengaged it from the shoe which was firmly clinched in the creature's teeth and let him drop the moment he was disengaged smith sprang for a more secure position and the animal at the same time leaped to another large tree about ten feet distant up which he ascended to an elevation equal to that of his victim from which he threw himself upon him firmly fixing his teeth in the calf of his leg hanging suspended thus until the flesh insufficient to sustain the weight gave way he dropped again to the ground carrying a portion of flesh in his mouth having greedily devoured this morsel he bounded again up the opposite tree and from thence upon smith in this manner renewing his attacks and tearing away the flesh in mouthfuls from his legs during this agonizing operation smith contrived to cut a limb from the tree to which he managed to bind his jack-knife with which he could now assail his enemy at every leap he succeeded thus in wounding him so badly that at length his attacks were discontinued and he finally disappeared in the dense forest during the encounter smith had exerted his voice to the utmost to alarm the crew who he hoped might be within hail he was heard and in a short time several of the crew reached the place but not in time to save him from the dreadful encounter the sight was truly appalling his garments were not only rent from him but the flesh literally torn from his legs exposing even the bone and sinews it was with the greatest difficulty he made the descent of the tree exhausted through loss of blood and overcome by fright and exertion he sunk upon the ground and immediately fainted but the application of snow restored him to consciousness preparing a litter from poles and boughs they conveyed him to the camp washed and dressed his wounds as well as circumstances would allow and as soon as possible removed him to the settlement where medical aid was secured after a protracted period of confinement he gradually recovered from his wounds though still carrying terrible scars and sustaining irreparable injury such desperate encounters are however of rare occurrence though collisions less sanguinary are not infrequent bear fight a sanguinary encounter with bears took place in the vicinity of terra height on the madawaska river a few years since a trap had been set by one of the men named jacob harrison who being out in search of a yoke of oxen on the evening in question saw a young bear fast in a trap and three others close at hand in a very angry mood a fact which rendered it necessary for him to make tracks immediately on arriving at the farm he gave the alarm and seizing an old dragoon sabre he was followed to the scene of action by mr james burke armed with a gun and the other man with an axe they proceeded direct to the trap supplied with a rope intending to take the young bear alive it being a short time after dark objects could not be distinctly seen but on approaching close to the scene of action a crashing among the leaves and dry branches with sundry other indications warned them of the proximity of the old animals when within a few steps of the spot a dark mass was seen on the ground a growl was heard and the confined beast made a furious leap on jacob who was in advance catching him by the legs the infuriated animal inflicted a severe wound on his knee upon which he drew his sword and defended himself with great coolness upon receiving several wounds from the sabre the cub commenced to growl and cry in a frightful and peculiar manner when the old she-bear attracted to the spot rushed on the adventurous harrison and attacked him from behind with great ferocity jacob turned upon the new foe and wielded his trusty weapon with such energy and success that in a short time he deprived her of one of her forepaws by a lucky stroke and completely disabled her eventually by a desperate cut across the neck which divided the tendons and severed the spine vertebra having completed his conquest 
he had ample time to dispatch the imprisoned cub at leisure during the time this stirring and dangerous scene we have related was enacting war was going on in equally bloody and vigorous style at a short distance mr burke having discharged his gun at the other old bear only slightly wounded him the enraged bruin sprang at him with a furious howl he was met with a blow from the butt end of the fowling piece at the first stroke the stock flew in pieces and the next the heavy barrel was hurled a distance of twenty feet among the underwood by a side blow from the dexterous paw of the bear mr burke then retreated a few feet and placed his back against a large hemlock followed the while closely by the bear but being acquainted with the nature of the animal and his mode of attack he drew a large hunting knife from his belt and placing his arms by his side coolly awaited the onset the maddened brute approached growling and gnashing his teeth and with a savage spring encircled the body of the hunter and the tree in his iron grip the next moment the flashing blade of the couteau chasse tore his abdomen and his smoking entrails rolled upon the ground at this exciting crisis of the struggle the other man accompanied by the dog came up in time to witness the triumphal close of the conflict two old bears and a cub were the fruit of this dangerous adventure all extremely fat the largest of which it is computed would weigh upward of two hundred and fifty pounds we have seldom heard of a more dangerous encounter with bears and we are happy to say that mr burke received no injury mr jacob harrison although torn severely and having three ribs broken recovered under the care of an indian doctor of the algonquin tribe the miners of bois monzil on tuesday february twenty second eighteen thirty one a violent detonation was suddenly heard in the coal mine of bois monzil belonging to m robineau the waters from the old works rushed impetuously along the new galleries the waters the waters such was the cry that resounded from the affrighted workmen throughout the mine only ten miners out of twenty-six were able to reach the entrance one of them brought off in his arms a boy eleven years old whom he thus saved from sudden death another impelled by the air and the water to a considerable distance could scarcely credit his escape from such imminent danger a third rushed forward with his sack full of coals on his shoulders which in his fright he had never thought of throwing down the disastrous news that sixteen workmen had perished in the mine of m rubineau was soon circulated in the town of st etienne it was regarded as one of those fatal and deplorable events unfortunately too common in that neighbourhood and on the ensuing thursday it was no longer talked of politics and the state of parties in paris exclusively occupied the public attention the engineers of the mines however and some of their pupils who on the first alarm had hastened to the spot still remained there continuing their indefatigable endeavours to discover the miners who were missing nothing that mechanical science manual labour and perseverance prompted by humanity could perform was left undone thirty hours had already elapsed since the fatal accident when two workmen announced the discovery of a jacket and some provisions belonging to the miners the engineers immediately essayed to penetrate into the galleries where these objects had been found which they accomplished with much difficulty by crawling on their hands and feet in vain they repeatedly called aloud no voice save the echo of their own answered from those narrow and gloomy vaults it then occurred to them to strike with their pickaxes against the roof of the mine still the same uncheering silence listen yes the sounds are answered by similar blows every heart beats every pulse quickens every breath is contracted yet perhaps it is but an illusion of their wishes or perhaps some deceitful echo they again strike the vaulted roof there is no longer any doubt the same number of strokes is returned no words can paint the varied feelings that pervaded every heart it was to use the expression of a person present a veritable delirium of joy of fear and of hope 
without losing an instant the engineers ordered a hole to be bored in the direction of the galleries where the miners were presumed to be at the same time they directed on another point the formation of an inclined well for the purpose of communicating with them two of the engineers pupils were now dispatched to the mayor of st etienne to procure a couple of fire pumps which they conducted back to the mine accompanied by two firemen in the ardor of youthful humanity these young men imagined that the deliverance of the miners was but the affair of a few hours and wishing to prepare an agreeable surprise for the friends of the supposed victims they gave strict injunctions at the mayoralty to keep the object of their expedition a profound secret notwithstanding the untiring efforts made to place these pumps in the mine it was found impossible either they were upon a plane too much inclined to admit of their playing with facility or the water was too muddy to be received up the pipes they were therefore abandoned in the meantime the attempts made to reach the miners by sounding or by the inclined well seemed to present insurmountable difficulties the distance to them was unknown the sound of their blows on the roof far from offering a certain criterion or at least a probable one seemed each time to excite fresh doubts in short the rock which it was necessary to pierce was equally hard and thick and the gunpowder unceasingly used to perforate it made but a hopeless progress the consequent anxiety that reigned in the mine may be easily conceived each of the party in his turn offered his suggestions sometimes of hope sometimes of apprehension and the whole felt oppressed by that vague suspense which is perhaps more painful to support than the direst certainty the strokes of the unfortunate miners continued to reply to theirs which added to their agitation from the fear of not being able to afford them effectual help they almost thought that in such a painful moment their situation was more distressing than those they sought to save as the latter were at any rate sustained by hope while most of the party were thus perplexed by a crowd of disquieting ideas produced by the distressing nature of the event itself and by their protracted stay in a mine where the few solitary lamps scarcely rendered darkness visible the workmen continued their labors with redoubled ardor some of them were hewing to pieces blocks of the rock which fell slowly and with much difficulty others were actively employed in boring the hole before named while some of the engineer's apprentices sought to discover new galleries either by creeping on all fours or by penetrating through perilous and narrow crevices and clefts of the rock in the midst of their corporeal and mental labors their attention was suddenly excited from another painful source the wives of the hapless miners had heard that all hope was not extinct they hastened to the spot with heart-rending cries and through tears alternately of despair and hope they exclaimed are they all there where is the father of my children is he among them or has he been swallowed up by the waters at the bottom of the mine close to the water reservoir a consultation was held on the plan to be pursued engineers pupils workmen all agreed that the only prospect of success consisted in exhausting the water which was already sensibly diminished by the working of the steam pump the other pumps produced little or no effect notwithstanding the vigorous efforts employed to render them serviceable it was then proposed remedying the failure of these pumps by un chien à bras viz by forming a line and passing buckets from one to the other this method was adopted and several of the pupils proceeded with all speed to st etienne it was midnight the general was beat in two quarters of the town only the hotel de ville was assigned as the place of rendezvous on the first alarm a great number of persons hurried to the town hall imagining a fire had broken out but on ascertaining the real cause several of them returned home apparently unmoved yet these same persons whose supposed apathy had excited both surprise and indignation quickly reappeared on the scene dressed in the uniform of the national guard so powerful is the magic influence of organized masses marching under the orders of a chief and stimulated by l'esprit de corps 
it was truly admirable to see with what address and rapidity the three or four hundred men who had hastened to boismoisil passed and repassed the buckets by forming a chain to the bottom of the mine but their generous efforts became too fatiguing to last long imagine a subterranean vault badly lighted where they were obliged to maintain themselves in a rapid descent in a stooping posture to avoid striking their heads against the roof of the vault and most of the time up to the middle in water which was dripping from every side some idea may then be formed of their painful situation they were relieved from this laborious duty by the guardia nacional of saint etienne whose zeal and enthusiasm exceeded all praise but a more precious reinforcement was at hand the workmen from the adjacent mines now arrived in great numbers from their skill and experience everything might be expected if they failed there was no further hope the chain au bras was again renewed by companies of the national guard relieved every two hours who at respective distances held the lights and under whose orders they acted it was a cheering spectacle to behold citizens of all ranks engaged in one of the noblest offices of humanity under the direction of poor colliers the immense advantages of the organization of the national guard were never more strikingly exemplified than on this occasion without them there would have been no means or possibility of uniting together an entire population of leading the people from a distance of more than three miles night and day so as to ensure a regular and continued service all would have been trouble and confusion with them on the contrary everything was ready and in motion at the voice of a single chief and the whole was conducted with such precision and regularity as had never on similar occasions been witnessed before the road from saint etienne to bois en manzil exhibited a scene of the most animated kind in the midst of the motley and moving multitude the national guards were seen hurrying to and fro chasseurs grenadiers cavalry and artillerymen all clothed in their rich new costume as on a field day some of the crowd were singing a la parisienne others were lamenting praying hoping despairing and by fits and starts abandoning themselves to those opposite extravagances of sentiment so peculiarly characteristic of a french population when night drew her sable curtains around the picturesque of the scene was still more heightened fresh bands of miners conducted by their respective chiefs coming in from every side their sooty visages lighted up by glaring torches national guards arriving from different parts of the country to join their comrades of saint etienne farmers and peasants on horseback and afoot hastening to offer their humane aid sentinels posted muskets piled watch-fires blazing and in short the tout ensemble rendered the approaches of bois manzil like a bivouac on the eve of an expected battle happily however the object of these brave men was to preserve life and not to destroy it on saturday the chain au bois was discontinued as the engineers had brought the pumps effectually to work suddenly a cry of joy was echoed from mouth to mouth they are saved they are saved six of them are freed from their subterranean prison shouted a person at the entrance of the mine the rumour was instantly repeated along the crowd and a horseman set off at full speed for saint etienne with the gratifying news another followed and confirmed the report of his predecessor the whole town was in motion and all classes seemed to partake of the general joy with a feeling as if each had been individually interested in the exuberance of their delight they were already deliberating on the subject of a fete to celebrate the happy event when a third horseman arrived the multitude thronged round him expecting a more ample confirmation of the welcome tidings but their joy was soon turned to sorrow when they were informed that nothing had yet been discovered save the dead bodies of two unfortunate men who together had left eleven children to lament their untimely fate on sunday the workmen continued their labor with equal zeal and uncertainty as before a sort of inquietude and hopelessness however occasionally pervaded their minds which may be easily accounted for from the hitherto fruitless result of their fatiguing researches 
discussions now took place on what was to be done differences of opinion arose on the various plans proposed and in the meantime the sounds of the hapless victims from the recesses of the rocky cavern continued to be distinctly audible every moment the embarrassment and difficulties of the workmen increased the flinty rock seemed to grow more impenetrable their tools either broke or became so fixed in the stone that it was frequently impossible to regain them the water filtered from all parts through the narrow gallery they were perforating and they even began to apprehend another eruption such was the fate of things on monday morning when at four o'clock an astounding noise was heard which re-echoed throughout the whole extent of the mine a general panic seized on every one it was thought that the waters had forced a new issue a rapid and confused flight took place but luckily their fears were soon allayed on perceiving that it was only an immense mass of rock detached from the mine which had fallen into a draining well this false alarm, however, operated in a discouraging manner on the minds of the workmen, and it required some management to bring them back to their respective stations, and to revive that ardor and constancy which they had hitherto so nobly displayed. They had scarcely renewed their endeavors to bore through the rock, when suddenly one of them felt the instrument drawn from his hands by the poor imprisoned miners it was indeed to them the instrument of deliverance from their cruel situation singular to relate their first request was neither for food nor drink but for light as if they were more eager to make use of their eyes than to satisfy the pressing wants of appetite it was now ascertained that eight of the sufferers still survived and this time an authentic account of the happy discovery was dispatched to st etienne where it excited the most enthusiastic demonstrations of sympathy and gladness but there is no pleasure unmixed with alloy no general happiness unaccompanied by particular exceptions among the workmen was the father of one of the men who had disappeared in the mine his paternal feelings seemed to have endowed him with superhuman strength night and day he never quitted his work but for a few minutes to return to it with redoubled ardour one sole absorbing thought occupied his whole soul the idea that his son his only son was with those who were heard from within in vain he was solicited to retire in vain they strove to force him from labors too fatiguing for his age my son is among them said he i hear him nothing shall prevent my hastening his release and from time to time he called on his son in accents that tore the hearts of the bystanders it was from his hand that the instrument had been drawn his first question was my child like apelles let me throw a veil over a father's grief his antoine was no more he had been drowned for four days several medical men were constantly on the spot to contribute all the succors that humanity skill and science could afford it was they who introduced through the hole broth and soup by means of long tin tubes which had been carefully prepared beforehand the poor captives distributed it with most scrupulous attention first to the oldest and weakest of their companions for notwithstanding their dreadful situation the spirit of concord and charity had never ceased for a single moment to preside among them the man who was appointed by the others to communicate with and answer the questions of their deliverers displayed in all his replies a gaiety quite in keeping with the french character on being asked what day he thought it was and on being informed that it was monday instead of sunday as he had supposed ah said he i ought to have known that as we yesterday indulged ourselves freely in drinking water strange that a man should have the heart to joke who had been thus cabined cribbed and confined during five days destitute of food deprived of air agitated by suspense and in jeopardy of perishing by the most horrible of all deaths there still remained full sixteen feet of solid rock between the two anxious parties but the workmen's labors were now if possible redoubled by the certainty of complete success 
at intervals light nourishment in regulated quantities continued to be passed to the miners this however they soon rejected expressing but one desire that their friends would make haste their strength began to fail them their respiration became more and more difficult their utterance grew feebler and fainter and toward six o'clock in the evening the last words that could be distinguished were brothers make haste the general anxiety was now wound up to the highest pitch it was perhaps the most trying crisis yet experienced since the commencement of their benevolent labors at length the moment of deliverance was all at once announced and at ten o'clock it was accomplished one by one they appeared like spectres gliding along the gallery which had just been completed their weak and agitated forms supported by the engineers on whom they cast their feeble eyes filled with astonishment yet beaming with gratitude accompanied by the doctors they all with one single exception ascended to the entrance of the mine without aid such was their eagerness to inhale the pure air of liberty from the mouth of the mine to the temporary residence allotted them the whole way was illuminated the engineers pupils and the workmen with the national guard under arms were drawn up in two lines to form a passage and thus in the midst of a religious silence did these poor fellows traverse an attentive and sympathizing crowd who as they passed along inclined their heads as a sort of respect and honor to their sufferings such are the affecting particulars of an event during the whole of which every kind of business was suspended at saint etienne an event which exhibited the entire population of a large town forming as it were but one heart entertaining but one thought imbued with one feeling for the godlike purpose of saving the lives of eight poor obscure individuals christians men of all countries whenever and wherever suffering humanity claims your aid go ye and do likewise end of section twenty section twenty one of thrilling adventures by land and sea by james o brayman this librivox recording is in the public domain section twenty one ship towed to land by bullocks a few years since the ship ariadne freighted principally with live cattle started on a voyage from quebec bound to halifax a gale came on which continued to increase in fury until it became a perfect hurricane the ship was dismasted and when the mainmast fell three poor fellows were crushed to death a little before sunset on the second day of the gale the appalling cry of breakers ahead was raised all eyes were instinctively turned in one direction and about a mile off the sea was as a boiling cauldron toward the breakers the hull was now drifting unmanageable every moment threatened with destruction for about half an hour there was intense anxiety and an agony of suspense on board at length she entered the breakers a large wave raised her and she struck heavily on the rocks as the waves receded it was evident from constant striking upon the bottom that the vessel must soon go to pieces and the sea made a clean break over her about half of the length from the stern the officers and crew were huddled together upon the deck forward intent upon devising means of escape at last the captain thought of a plan which though novel proved successful he fastened ropes to the horns of several bullocks and drove them into the sea their strong instinctive love of life impelled them forward and several of them reached the shore the ropes were fastened by some men who had assembled for the relief of those on the vessel and after much exertion and danger all on board were rescued from their perilous situation and landed in safety destruction of a ship by a whale the following thrilling account of the destruction of the whale ship Anne Alexander, Captain John S. Dublois of New Bedford, by a large sperm whale, is from the lips of the captain himself. 
a similar circumstance has never been known to occur but once in the whole history of whale fishing and that was the destruction of the ship essex some twenty or twenty-five years ago and which many of our readers fully remember we proceed to the narrative as furnished by captain dubreuil and which is fully authenticated by nine of the crew in a protest under the seal of the united states consul alexander rudin jr at pieta the ship anne alexander captain j s dubreuil sailed from new bedford massachusetts june first eighteen fifty for a cruise in the south pacific for sperm whale having taken about five hundred barrels of oil in the atlantic the ship proceeded on her voyage to the pacific nothing of unusual interest occurred until when passing cape horn one of the men named jackson walker of newport new hampshire was lost overboard in a storm reaching the pacific she came up the coast and stopped at valdivia on the coast of chile for fresh provisions and the thirty first of may last she called a pieta for the purpose of shipping a man the vessel proceeded on her return voyage to the south pacific on the twentieth of august last she reached what is well known to all whalers as the offshore ground in latitude five degrees fifty minutes south longitude one hundred and twenty degrees west in the morning of that day at about nine o'clock whales were discovered in the neighborhood and about noon the same day they succeeded in making fast to one two boats had gone after the whales the larboard and the starboard the former commanded by the first mate the latter by captain dubreuil the whale which they had struck was harpooned by the larboard boat after running some time the whale turned upon the boat and rushing at it with tremendous violence lifted open its enormous jaws and taking the boat in actually crushed it into fragments as small as a common chair captain dubreuil immediately struck for the scene of the disaster with the starboard boat and succeeded against all expectation in rescuing the whole of the crew of the boat nine in number there were now eighteen men in the starboard boat consisting of the captain the first mate and the crews of both boats the frightful disaster had been witnessed from the ship and the waste boat was called into readiness and sent to their relief the distance from the ship was about six miles as soon as the waste boat arrived the crews were divided and it was determined to pursue the same whale and make another attack upon him accordingly they separated and proceeded at some distance from each other as is usual on such occasions after the whale in a short time they came up to him and prepared to give him battle the waste boat commanded by the first mate was in advance as soon as the whale perceived the demonstration being made upon him he turned his course suddenly and making a tremendous dash at this boat seized it with his widespread jaws and crushed it to atoms allowing the men barely time to escape his vengeance by throwing themselves into the ocean captain dubreuil again seeing the perilous condition of his men at the risk of meeting the same fate directed his boat to hasten to their rescue and in a short time succeeded in saving them all from a death little less horrible than that from which they had twice as narrowly escaped he then ordered the boat to put for the ship as speedily as possible and no sooner had the order been given than they discovered the monster of the deep making toward them with his jaws widely extended fortunately the monster came up and passed them at a short distance the boat then made her way to the ship and they all got on board in safety after reaching the ship a boat was dispatched for the oars of the demolished boats and it was determined to pursue the whale with the ship as soon as the boat returned with the oars sail was set and the ship proceeded after the whale in a short time she overtook him and a lance was thrown into his head the ship passed on by him and immediately after they discovered that the whale was making for the ship as he came up near her they hauled on the wind and suffered the monster to pass her after he had fairly passed they kept off to overtake and attack him again when the ship had reached within about fifty rods of him they discovered that the whale had settled down deep below the surface of the water and as it was near sundown they concluded to give up the pursuit 
Captain Dubois was at this time standing in the night heads on the larboard bow, with lance in hand, ready to strike the monster a deadly blow should he appear, the ship moving about five knots, when, working on the side of the ship, he discovered the whale rushing toward her at the rate of fifteen knots. In an instant the monster struck the ship with tremendous violence, shaking her from stem to stern. She quivered under the violence of the shock, as if she had struck upon a rock. Captain de Blois immediately descended into the forecastle, and there, to his horror, discovered that the monster had struck the ship two feet from the keel, abreast the foremast, knocking a great hole entirely through her bottom. Springing to the deck, he ordered the mate to cut away the anchors and set the cables overboard to keep the ship from sinking, as she had a large quantity of pig iron on board. In doing this, the mate succeeded in getting only one anchor and one cable clear, the other having been fastened around the foremast. The ship was then sinking rapidly. The captain went to the cabin, where he found three feet of water. He, however, succeeded in procuring a chronometer, sextant, and chart. Reaching the decks, he ordered the boats to be cleared away, and got water and provisions as the ship was keeling over. He again descended to the cabin, but the water was rushing in so rapidly that he could procure nothing. He then came upon deck, ordered all hands into the boats, and was the last to leave the ship, which he did by throwing himself into the sea and swimming to the nearest boat. The ship was on her beam end, a top gallant yards under the water. They then pushed off some distance from the ship, expecting her to sink in a very short time. Upon an examination of the stores they had been able to save, he discovered that they had only twelve quarts of water and not a mouthful of provisions of any kind. The boats contained eleven men each, were leaky, and night coming on, they were obliged to bail them all night to keep them from sinking. Next day at daylight they returned to the ship, no one daring to venture on board but the captain, their intention being to cut away the masts, and fearful that the moment the masts were cut away that the ship would go down. With a single hatchet the captain went on board, cut away the mast when the ship righted. The boat then came up, and the men, by the sole aid of spades, cut away the chain cable from around the foremast, which got the ship nearly on her keel. The men then tied ropes round their bodies, got into the sea, and cut a hole through the decks to get out provisions. They could procure nothing but about five gallons of vinegar and twenty pounds of wet bread. The ship threatened to sink, and they deemed it prudent to remain by her no longer, so they set sail in their boats and left her. On the 22nd of August, at about 5 o'clock p.m., they had the indescribable joy of seeing a ship in the distance. They made signal and were soon answered, and in a short time they were reached by the ship Nantucket of Nantucket, Massachusetts, Captain Gibbs, who took them on board, clothed and fed them, and extended to them in every way the greatest possible hospitality. On the succeeding day, Captain Gibbs went to the wreck of the ill-fated Anne Alexander for the purpose of trying to procure something, but as the sea was rough and the attempt considered dangerous, he abandoned the project. The Nantucket then set sail for Pieta, where she arrived on the 15th of September, and where she landed Captain de Blois and his men. Captain de Blois was kindly received and hospitably entertained at Pieta by Captain Bathurst, an English gentleman residing there, and subsequently took passage on board the schooner Providence, Captain Starbuck, for Panama. Burning of the Kent the annexed engraving represents the burning of the Kent, East Indiaman, in the Bay of Biscay. She had on board in all 641 persons at the time of the accident. The fire broke out in the hold during a storm. An officer on duty, finding that a spirit cask had broken loose, was taking measures to secure it when a lurch of the ship caused him to drop his lantern, and in his eagerness to save it he let go the cask, which suddenly stove in, the spirits communicated with the flame, and the whole place was instantly in a blaze. Hopes of subduing the fire at first were strong, but soon heavy volumes of smoke and a pitchy smell told that it had reached the cable room. 
in these awful circumstances the captain ordered the lower decks to be scuttled to admit water this was done several poor seamen being suffocated by the smoke in executing the order but now a new danger threatened the sea rushed in so furiously that the ship was becoming waterlogged and all feared her going down between six and seven hundred human beings were by this time crowded on the deck many on their knees earnestly implored the mercy of an all-powerful god while some old stout-hearted sailors quietly seated themselves directly over the powder magazine expecting an explosion every moment and thinking thus to put a speedier end to their torture in this time of despair it occurred to the fourth mate to send a man to the foremast hoping but scarce daring to think it probable that some friendly sail might be in sight the man at the foretop looked around him it was a moment of intense anxiety then waving his hat he cried out a sail on the lee bow those on deck received the news with heartfelt gratitude and answered with three cheers signals of distress were instantly hoisted and endeavors used to make toward the stranger while the minute guns were fired continuously she proved to be the brig cambria captain cook master bound to vera cruz having twenty cornish miners and some agents of the mining company on board for about a quarter of an hour the crew of the kent doubted whether the brig perceived their signals but after a period of dreadful suspense they saw the british colours hoisted and the brig making toward them on this the crew of the kent got their boats in readiness the first was filled with women passengers and officers wives and was lowered into a sea so tempestuous as to leave small hope of their reaching the brig they did however after being nearly swamped through some entanglement of the ropes getting clear of the kent and were safely taken on board the cambria which prudently lay at some distance off after the first trip it was found impossible for the boats to come close alongside of the kent and the poor women and children suffered dreadfully in being lowered over the stern into them by means of ropes amid this gloomy scene many beautiful examples occurred of filial and parental affection and of disinterested friendship and many sorrowful instances of individual loss and suffering at length when all had been removed from the burning vessel but a few who were so overcome by fear as to refuse to make the attempt to reach the brig the captain quitted his ill-fated ship the flames which had spread along her upper deck now mounted rapidly to the mast and rigging forming one general conflagration and lighting up the heavens to an immense distance around one by one her stately masts fell over her sides by half-past one in the morning the fire reached the powder magazine the looked-for explosion took place and the burning fragments of the vessel were blown high into the air like so many rockets the cambria with her crowd of sufferers made all speed to the nearest port and reached portsmouth in safety shortly after midnight on the third of march eighteen twenty five the accident having taken place on the twenty eighth of february wonderful to tell fourteen of the poor creatures left on the kent were rescued by another ship the caroline on her passage from alexandria to liverpool End of section 21. End of Thrilling Adventures by Land and Sea by James O. Brayman.